Gunther. Okay, let me got it. Okay, welcome to the second week of the 2023 Jetscape Summer School. Um, as you know, today the focus is on heavy flavor. We'll have uh, two experimental and one uh, theory talk this morning. Um, those of you who also attended last week, of course, know the drill. Uh, we very much encourage questions. Ideally, they would be posted in the uh, Slack channel for today's session, July 24-heavy-box. Um, if you have a really urgent question, you should also uh, you can also try to interrupt uh, on Zoom. If uh, somehow you can't find the Slack channel, uh, you can also post your question on Zoom and we'll transplant it. But ideally, as I said, please uh, uh, post your questions on Slack. And then, of course, all the experts connected can uh, try to help answer these questions, or Yenje will uh, interrupt the speaker to um, uh, point to the question. And uh, we will start, as I said, with uh, the first of the two experimental talks by uh, Deepa Thomas, who will tell us about heavy flavor in heavy iron collisions, uh, part one. So uh, let's, uh, let's get that started. Uh, Deepa, I think you can share your slides. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll try to uh, sort of um, run the talk for about 40 minutes and then leave some time for questions. So I think at uh, 9.35, uh, I'll uh, say, give a 10 minute warning. Okay, so I will mute and uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Gunther. So as uh, Gunther mentioned, so we'll have um, two experimental talks today on heavy flavor and one theory talks. So the way we organized uh, the talk is, um, um, sorry, oh, by the way, can you see my slides? Yes, looks good. Yes. Um, then Totally full screen, but uh, I guess if this is as large as it gets, it's okay. Um, yeah, let me try. Yeah. Good. Okay, looks good. Okay, so um, so yeah, as as I mentioned, the first part, uh, the way we organized is um, the first part will have some introduction to heavy flavor on uh, what's the motivation, why study heavy flavor, uh, and experimentally how heavy flavor particles are studied and, and measured. And then I'll show some of the experimental results. And in part two, Jamikele will go through uh, more new techniques of how heavy flavor uh, particles are measured, the strategies and challenges, and the future uh, direction. So, um, so we know that uh, coagulone plasma uh, are produced in, uh, in uh, ultra relativistic uh, heavy ion collisions. So here is a schematic diagram of the evolution of, uh, of a heavy ion collisions. And uh, by uh, studying them um, and looking at uh, different uh, particles, especially uh, light flavor particles, we, we have obtained uh, experimental evidence for the QGP formation. But we also understand some of the properties uh, of the of the of the medium. So we know that uh, the produced medium is strongly interacting, and the evolution can be described by uh, hydrodynamics, um, and and it behaves like an ideal love fluid. And we also know that the the uh, the produced medium has a high energy density, so it can produce high mass state particles such as strange quarks uh, thermally itself. And we also know that the, the, the QGP medium is uh, opaque to high energy particles. So uh, when high energy uh, particles travel through the medium, it undergoes uh, energy loss. But all of these uh, understanding of uh, QGP uh, comes from a very macroscopic uh, perspective. But what we want to know is how QCD interactions at the microscopic level can lead to these uh, emergent phenomena. So what we should be able to probe the QGP uh, at a smaller length scale to understand the inner workings of QGP. So basically looking at QGP using a microscope. And to do this, we can use uh, high energy or high mass particles as they can probe uh, short distances. And heavy quarks are uh, one of these uh, very interesting probe uh, that, that we can uh, use to do it. 
So why is uh, heavy quark especially interesting? It's it's uh, 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 apart from it being uh, because it's uh, it is heavy mass. Uh, they are uh, produced um, in the initial hard scattering. So if we look at this uh, the schematic diagram of the QGP evolution or the uh, heavy ion collision, um, uh, we, we because of the uh, higher mass, these heavy quarks are produced in the initial uh, hard scattering process. So their, uh, they, their production can be calculated using uh, perturbative techniques. So, uh, and then these heavy quarks, the uh, as the as the QGP is formed and and as it evolves, uh, these heavy quarks interact with the medium. They undergo uh, energy loss uh, by collisional and radiative processes. And at low PT, uh, these heavy quarks behave like um, uh, Brownian motion. So we can extract uh, some of the QGP properties, such as spatial diffusion coefficients, uh, by measuring heavy uh, flavor particles at low uh, momentum. And then by measuring charm and beauty quarks, because they are, uh, uh, charm is lighter than and beauty quarks, we can use um, the, their masses and study if there is a mass hierarchy. Because we expect that um, as uh, the, the heavier mass particles would lose much uh, less energy compared to lighter quarks. So we can study these aspects uh, as well. And finally, uh, as the system evolves and um, uh, expands and cools down, uh, the partons um, are hadronized, so the heavy quarks also hadronize to form uh, heavy flavor particles. But because the energy density uh, is not high enough uh, to produce these heavy quarks thermally, the probability of uh, them being uh, 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 either produced in the medium or being annihilated is, is very less. So because of that, the identity of the heavy quarks remains uh, till the end. So we can use these uh, heavy flavor particles, measure them and, and track back to the early stages of the collision. So we can study the full evolution of the medium using uh, heavy quarks. So how do we study uh, heavy flavor particles? So we can either use open heavy flavor particles where these heavy quarks hadronize uh, with light quarks and form uh, D mesons or B mesons. Uh, so you see what the, the, uh, the quark composition uh, here is um, quickly, if you want to just have an idea, um, and, and also uh, baryons. So with these open heavy flavor particles, we can study um, the uh, in medium interactions and also look at if there is a dependence of these interactions uh, versus uh, mass of the of the quark or even the color charge, and using open heavy flavor uh, particles, we can also study the fragmentation and hadronization uh, processes or modification of them in the presence uh, of the medium. Another way is by looking at uh, quarkonia or hidden uh, heavy flavor, which are bound state of uh, CC bar and BV bar pairs. For example, J psi and upsilon uh, and their excited states. So these quarkonia particles are expected to uh, experience color screening effect in the presence of um, the deconfined uh, medium. So um, when they experience these uh, the, the, the color screening effect, the, uh, the quarkonia can dissociate. So we would see a suppression in the quarkonia production. But this depends on the binding energy of the, of the quarkonia and also the temperature of the medium. So what we expect is a sequential uh, suppression pattern uh, for different states of quarkonia, where loosely bound uh, quarkonia states would dissociate much faster than uh, strongly bound uh, quarkonia. So uh, for example, upsilon uh, 1s state are strongly uh, tightly bound. So we would need much higher temperature for it to be uh, dissociated compared to um, uh, more loosely bound uh, upsilon 2s or 3s state and similarly between j psi and uh, psi 2s. But on the other hand, if uh, uh, charm and beauty quarks are uh, uh, produced a lot in, in, in heavy ion collisions, especially at LHC energies, uh, and they thermalize, uh, at, the, at the later stage of the evolution at hadronization, these uh, uh, thermalized heavy quarks can come together and uh, form quarkonia states at much uh, later phase. So this would mean that these quarkonia states are regenerated at the later stage of the, of the collision. So these are, this goes in the opposite direction of the suppression. So we can study these different aspects by looking at uh, quarkonia particles. 
And of course, these uh, oh, both heavy uh, open heavy flavor and corconia uh, state particles are uh, do not have uh, do not uh, uh, are not stable particles, so they they, they decay readily. Um, so experimentally, we cannot measure them. So what we can do is to measure these the final state uh, particles uh, and then reconstruct the the parent or the heavy flavor hadrons. So we can use either inclusive channels, for example, uh, leptons um, or, or uh, demesons uh, from uh, beauty decays, uh, which gives us partial information of uh, uh, of the of the, the kinematics of the heavy, uh, of the heavy flavor hadron. Uh, but the advantage here is that they have a larger branching ratio, so uh, we would have much uh, larger sample to, to study them. Or we could use ex exclusive channels where, uh, for example, the zero going to k, uh, k on and pi on, uh, which have a smaller branching ratio, but we can reconstruct them fully and get the full uh, kinematics of the, um, of the, of the hadrons. So the way we do it is uh, to identify these uh, final state particles such as pions, kaons, electrons, protons, which can be detected uh, in, in the detector uh, using different techniques. For example, here I show the, the energy loss in the time projection chamber where we, we can uh, identify different particle species. So here's the pion, uh, the electron, kaon, proton, and neutron, for example. And then use these uh, particles to reconstruct the, the heavy flavor hadrons. Um, so for, for example, demesons uh, can be reconstructed by identifying uh, secondary vertex that are displaced from the primary vertex because the, the, the demesons uh, take some time to, to, to decay. Uh, so, and we can use these, uh, the decay topology and uh, to enhance the signal uh, with respect to the background and calculate the invariant mass of the, the, the decay products. For example, here I show the, uh, the, the decay of D0 to K on and pi on, and, look, and, and here is the invariant mass uh, distribution of uh, K on and pi on pairs. And we clearly see uh, this, uh, this peak here corresponding to uh, demesons. Similarly, corconia states can be uh, reconstructed by uh, um, looking at the invariant, reconstructing the invariant mass of uh, lepton pairs, either electron, uh, positron, or muon, uh, antimuon uh, pairs. And then subtracting the background in both cases, we, we, can, uh, we can extract the, the yield of uh, uh, heavy flavor particles. And for to measure beauty uh, particles, we can use their uh, longer lifetime with respect to uh, charm um, by looking at distance uh, to closest approach with respect to the primary vertex. And this for the beauty hadrons or particles coming from beauty uh, hadrons will have a larger uh, DCA, uh, and and we can use this property to separate out. Uh, uh, particles coming from beauty hadrons compared to charm or uh, other background sources. So these are the experimental techniques in general that we can, that we use to uh, to measure uh, heavy flavor particles. So let me uh, show some of the the measurements that uh, that we have and what we can understand uh, from these measurements. So the first set of measurements that I will show is the azimuthal anisotropy or VN, uh, which can give us information about the initial uh, collision geometry and also about uh, fluctuations uh, in these collisions. And then I'll, I'll show some of the results on uh, nuclear modification factor or RAA, which can give us information about the energy loss of heavy quarks in the, in the QGP. And then finally, I'll show some uh, measurements on jet fragmentation and hadronization process and how what we can learn about these processes using uh, heavy quarks. So the first measurement is uh, the collective flow, where uh, we look at the azimuthal distribution of particles in the plane perpendicular uh, to the uh, beam axis. And this measurement is sensitive to the early dynamics um, uh, of the collision. So if we look at uh, a semi-central uh, lead, lead or heavy ion collisions, we see that the overlap region is anisotropic. So we would see um, a kind of an almond shape uh, produced in this, uh, in this uh, collision. And the QGP produced in such a collision will have a high density uh, center and vacuum outside. So this, this, and this huge pressure gradient uh, will uh, lead to a rapid expansion of the, of the system. So the initial anisotropy in space 
um, uh, translates into a momentum isotropy. So to see what happens, what, uh, what happens in such a uh, evolution, we can look at uh, the strongly correlated uh, ultra cold atoms and see uh, and demonstrate what, what basically happens uh, in, in such an evolution. So a system which starts by, um, which looks like this in the initial stages would, would uh, expand. And finally, we would end up in a system which, which looks like this. So this is because of the of the pressure gradient uh, 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 have leading to this um, uh, uh, making an, an isotropic distribution uh, tra translating into a momentum uh, an isotropy. And if we look at the uh, azimuthal distribution of the particle with respect to let's say this plane that I draw here, we would get um, uh, a distribution uh, azimuthal distribution which looks like this. So clearly there is an anisotropy in the azimuthal distribution. And if we do a Fourier uh, decomposition of this distribution, the second coefficient of this Fourier decomposition will give us the strength of this anisotropy. So this, has, this was measured for light flavor particles. And uh, what we know from these measurements for light flavor particles is that this anisotropy can be explained or this evolution can be explained using hydrodynamic models. So why is it interesting uh, to study heavy uh, quarks? So heavy quarks, as I mentioned before, are produced in the initial hot scattering. So they are randomly produced in space. So they are as they are uh, uh, the, as as a total, it would be uh, azimuthally isotropic when they are produced in the initial hot scattering. Now, depending on how strongly it interacts with the medium, we can either expect that uh, these heavy quarks finally end up being uh, isotropically distributed if they do not interact strongly with the medium. But if they interact strongly with the medium, they would uh, if they would expand or evolve similar uh, to the medium, and we would see a similar anisotropy in the heavy flavor distribution in the final state. So think of it as um, if we if we throw a, a rock uh, or a stone uh, to a flowing medium, depending on the strength of the of the flow of the medium, it can either carry uh, this heavy uh, stone or heavy rock with it or the, the stone would drop um, uh, independent of the flow of the, of the medium. This is exactly what we want to study uh, using heavy quarks, uh, heavy quark uh, azimuthal anisotropic measurement. But also we note that because of the higher mass, we expect that uh, the heavy quarks, even if they thermalize or equilibrate with the medium, uh, it would take much longer uh, for them compared to uh, light quarks. Okay, so here is a, a measurement of uh, V2 for um, heavy flavor particles. Um, so on black here, we see the, as a comparison, uh, the V2 of uh, pions uh, compared to the V2 of D mesons shown in orange or, or yellow uh, points. And in red is the V2 of J psi, which are bound state of um, uh, char uh, charm, anti-charm uh, pairs. So what we see is, uh, so before I sh uh, explain what we see in this measurement, let me just uh, uh, say that at low PT, these measurement uh, can give us information about the collective flow, but also hydronization effects. But at high PT, uh, this V2 measurement uh, can give us information about the, the dependence of, uh, of the path or, or the energy loss dependence on the path of the, the path uh, traveled by the, the quark. So if we take, for example, a semi-central uh, collision, uh, such as uh, shown here, uh, when particles travel um, in this direction, they see, they, they, they see uh, uh, more medium, so they would lose more energy with respect to particles going in this direction, so they would see, which would see much less uh, um, energy loss. So because of this uh, difference in the energy loss dependent, depending on the, the path length traveled uh, by, the, uh, by the heavy quarks, we would see in an isotropy in the final state uh, uh, distribution, which we would see in this in this high PT region. So, if we if when we measure this, what we see is the V two uh, at low PT for uh, heavy quarks um, are, are non zero. So clearly, they they do undergo some uh, they they, uh, they interact with the medium strongly, uh, but the V two is uh, smaller than that of light flavor uh, when we compare D mesons to light uh, to pions. And if we look at the V2 for J psi, uh, we see the V2 to be much smaller or even smaller than D mesons. 
So this can be explained because the V2 uh, that we see is because of the, the flow of the charm quark, but also um, uh, because of recombination or how they, uh, they hadronize with light quarks. So the demesons would carry the V2 of the light quark as well, not just uh, the charm quark. But from these measurements, we can clearly say that charm quark interacts strongly with the medium and also participate in the, in the expansion, the collective expansion of the medium. What about beauty quarks, which are uh, much uh, massive or much um, uh, uh, higher mass than, than charm quark? Uh, yeah, so in red here, you see the V2 for, um, for demesons coming from beauty decay. So we can, um, uh, we are looking at uh, the V2 of B quark itself. And compared to uh, charm quark or demesons, we see the V2 to be smaller. So indicating that beauty quarks don't uh, interact as strongly as, as charm quark. And if we compare it with uh, the upsilon, uh, which are bound state of BB bar, uh, we see the V2 to be uh, zero, but with large error bar. So the measurement is not precise enough to clearly say whether um, uh, um, the whether beauty quarks interact strongly. But we do see a non-zero V2 for, uh, for beauty hadrons. And this could be because of path length dependent energy laws or because of uh, recombination with the light quarks. And one point that I uh, forgot to mention is that uh, what we see at, at high PT, both for charm and also for, uh, uh, for beauty is that uh, at high PT, the, the V2 um, does not show a mass dependence or a flavor dependence, indicating that this path length dependent energy loss is similar for uh, light flavor and for the heavy flavor uh, particles. What about V3? V3 is a measurement that is sensitive to fluctuations in the initial energy density in the overlap region. So comparing the, the V3 of uh, pions with uh, D mesons and J psi, uh, what we see is we, we see a, a, this mass hierarchy that we saw also for uh, V2. Um, we see a positive V3 for, uh, for heavy quarks, uh, but lower than, uh, than light quarks. Uh, but this all this indicates that uh, charm quarks are also are thermally uh, equilibrated to an additional confirmation that charm quarks are thermally equilibrated in the in the medium. And if we uh, compare or if we look at the, the V2 and V3 as a function of centrality, um, so in black here is the, uh, the Vn shown for charged particle in black and, and in the colored points correspond to mesons. Uh, what we immediately notice is that the centrality dependence itself is similar for charm and for light quarks. While V2 shows a, a strong centrality dependence, and this is expected because of the collision geometry and viscosity effects, the V3 uh, shows much weaker centrality dependence. This is also expected because uh, the fluctuations that we see in the, um, in the initial stages or the, in the initial energy density is not centrality uh, dependent. Hence, we don't see uh, a centrality dependence in V2 for both charged particles and for heavy flavor or, or for charm particles. What about um, the V2 for charm in, uh, as a function of uh, um, center of mass uh, energies? We can do that by comparing the V2 at LHC and at RIC. Um, and here we see that both at LHC and RIC, the V2 is very similar for D mesons. This is quite interesting. So this indicates that even though the energy uh, produced in, in these uh, uh, are quite different, uh, charm quark um, interacts very strongly in both, uh, in both energies. Now, moving on to the next set of measurements, which are uh, the nuclear modification factor, or RAA, which is the ratio of the, the yield as a function of PT um, in lead-lead collisions compared to proton-proton collisions, where the proton-proton collision is scaled up uh, with the average number of binary nucleon-nucleon collision. So this depends on, this number depends on how central uh, the collision is. So if let's say there is no medium or heavy quarks don't interact with the, with the medium, uh, we would see an RAA uh, or the ratio to be equal to one. So this indicates no medium effects uh, seen. While if we see an RAA less than one, it indicates an energy loss. Um, and and if we, when we measured this for D mesons, um, what we see is as a function of centrality, 
so in blue is the RAA in P lead collisions, where in minimum bias P lead collisions, where we don't expect uh, a large uh, QGP uh, medium produced, the RAA is consistent with one. So our uh, the scaling that we use here uh, is uh, is pretty good. Uh, this is also a cross check. And if we go to more in, in lead lead or in heavy ion collisions um, as a function of cent uh, centrality, we see that the, uh, the RAA uh, reduces or the, uh, the energy loss increases as we go from more peripheral to more central collisions. So this indicates that a uh, hotter and more denser medium is produced in more central uh, collisions compared to uh, peripheral uh, collisions. What if we measure at uh, uh, RIC versus LHC? Uh, here again, we see that uh, similar to V2, the RAA for D mesons is similar uh, for both collision uh, energies. This is also very surprising because we expect a larger system or a larger QGP, uh, QGP system produced at LHC because of the higher energies. Uh, and also, but, but on the other hand, the, the, the spectral shape is different, is much harder at LHC. So it could be this interplay between these two effects that gives uh, similar RAA at LHC and at, at, at RIC. So as I said, with uh, heavy quarks, we can look at uh, mass-dependent energy loss. It is not um, easy or straightforward to compare charm uh, with with uh, with pions or like flavor particles for energy loss because the production mechanism for the two are very different. While we know that heavy quarks are produced in the initial hot scattering and they are not produced in the in the in the medium, that's not the case for light flavor particles where uh, light 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 quarks and gluons can be produced in the medium. So the pion production can come from uh, anywhere uh, in the in the evolution. So it, we cannot do a one to one comparison between uh, charm quark and and light quarks. But instead, we can look at D mesons and B mesons as their production mechanism are very similar, both produce the initial hot scattering, we can compare the, uh, the RAA of these two to study if there is a mass dependent uh, energy loss. And that, that's exactly what we see here uh, by looking at uh, D mesons coming from uh, BDKs uh, compared to uh, the prompt D mesons, so the, the D mesons produced in hot scattering or charm produced in hot scattering, um, we see that the charm quark loses more energy compared to uh, B quarks because the RAA for the blue points are, are higher and, and in this uh, intermediate and, and uh, uh, high PT uh, region. But if we go to even higher PT, uh, we see that the RAA is similar for both uh, charm and beauty quarks. But again, here we, we need more measurements to, to accurately see at what point uh, the two coincides or uh, um, whether they would deviate at much higher PT. So this is something that we can look forward to in the, uh, in the upcoming runs at LHC and also um, uh, at RIC. We can look at Corconia uh, particles such as uh, JPSI uh, to study the suppression or the dissociation uh, because of color screening effect and also regeneration effects. So if we look at the JPSI RAA as a function of uh, centrality at RIC, what we see is more central we go, the, the, the JPSI uh, seems to have uh, show a larger suppression. So clearly indicating that uh, the JPSI dissociates or sub gets suppressed as we go to more central collisions, larger the medium, more suppression effects. But on the other hand, if we look at the uh, results at LHC, we see that the, uh, the, the, the RAA uh, the suppression increases, but at some point uh, they equilibrate. So the RAA uh, flattens out. So this is because of these regeneration effects where uh, the CC bar pairs are copiously produced at LHC energy. So they can come together uh, at the later stage and form uh, JFSI uh, particles again. So hence we see a difference in, in behavior uh, at RIC versus uh, at LHC. And we can look at this uh, sequential suppression pattern by comparing the RAA of JPSI and uh, Psi2S uh, because the, the JPSI have uh, um, a larger binding energy and also uh, they're more tightly bound compared to Psi2S. And, and this is exactly what we see in the measurement as well, where the Psi2S uh, shows a larger suppression 
uh, compared to JFSI, but we don't see a very different PT dependence. So the PT dependence of the RA is very similar for JFSI and, and CYTOS, indicating that uh, the final state effects or the recombination effects are quite similar um, for, for both the cases. We can look at bottomodium, the, the higher mass uh, particles, to see uh, how the suppression pattern looks like and also if there is any regeneration effects. So if we, if we can compare the, the upsilon 1s state, which are more tightly bound to upsilon 2s state, and we see as expected, the upsilon 2s states are, are uh, more uh, strongly suppressed uh, compared to um, uh, upsilon 1s state. Um, and here we, uh, we don't see this, uh, we see the pattern to uh, the, the suppression to increase as we go to more central collisions. Uh, indicating that the regeneration effects are not as significant. Also expected because duty quarks are much uh, heavier, so the production cross-section is not as high as chump quarks, so the number of BB bar uh, pairs uh, in, the, in the medium is, is, is lower, and, uh, they, and as we saw from B2, they don't thermalize uh, to, to, come to, to come together at the later stage uh, to form uh, these BB bar bound state. Uh, particles. And in fact, the models which, uh, which do not include regeneration effects also describes the data quite well. So can we learn something by comparing these open and uh, hidden or uh, charmonia states? We can uh, try to compare the, the D-mesons and JPSI, which are uh, charm uh, quark uh, hadrons. And we see that the RAA uh, as a function of PT, the both D mesons and JFSI show a very similar uh, PT dependence. While on the other hand, for in the beauty sector, uh, the upsilon um, uh, 1s state and uh, uh, beauty hadrons measured using uh, JFSI coming from uh, B quark decays, uh, we, we see a different uh, scenario at low PT, uh, while at high PT, the RAA is, is very similar. So this could be because uh, at low PT, we know that the upsilon does not, uh, we don't see regeneration effects uh, um, for upsilon, uh, while the hadronization can be affected, uh, what the be beauty hadrons are affected by different hadronization mechanisms, which I'll come to in the, in the later slides. And this could give this uh, difference, a difference in the RAA behavior at, at low PT for, for beauty. Now, all the measurements that I showed till now uh, looks at uh, counting uh, heavy flavor particles in total and looking at the PT distribution. Uh, what we can do further is uh, looking at how uh, heavy quark uh, but, uh, propagate in the medium um, and if, if the, jet, the jet evolution itself is modified as they, as they propagate in the medium. And we can do that by uh, looking at heavy flavor jet and also uh, other observables, um, such as looking at back-to-back -back configuration of uh, heavy quarks. Um, as they are the, in, in the hard scattering processes, uh, they're produced back-to-back -back at, at first order or at leading order. But as they interact in the medium, they can lose this back-to-back uh, -back configuration. So we can use different uh, techniques to, um, to study these, um, uh, these effects. So Jamikele will go um, in more detail in the, next, uh, in the next talk, but let me just show that uh, some of the measurements that we have, uh, which looks at these uh, uh, evolution aspect of heavy quarks or jet evolution. Uh, so this is done this, uh, by looking at the radial distribution of uh, D-mesons with respect to the jet axis. And what we see is in uh, in lead-lead collisions shown in red points here, compared to proton-proton shown in blue, the the red uh, the the in lead-lead collisions the D-mesons seem to be uh, farther away from the jet axis. So indicating that because of the diffusion effects. Uh, the D mesons lose uh, the uh, the initial correlation with the with the jet axis because of the interaction with the with the medium, um, and we can also look at correlations uh, to study how the uh, heavy quarks um, evolve in the medium. Uh, for example, here is a measurement looking at uh, the particle distribution inside a heavy flavor jet on the um, on the near side uh, along the jet axis or on the opposite side, which looks at the, the particles in the opposite jet. 
Clearly on the near side, we see that in lead lead collision shown in red points, the yield is much higher compared to um, a system which does not have QGP, for example, in P red collisions. Um, this indicates that this enhanced production of charged particles in the jet uh, could be accounted for, uh, uh, to the gluon radiation as heavy quarks uh, travel through the medium and lose energy by gluon radiation. So, and these these gluons, low momentum gluons, uh, then becomes charged particles, giving a larger uh, number, um, indicating that the energy loss goes into low momentum particles, uh, in the, or we can see the energy loss uh, at low um, momentum particles. So finally, uh, uh, the topic that I want to briefly discuss is the hadronization um, on how we can use heavy quarks to study the uh, different hadronization mechanisms. So in general, we understand or we can uh, study hadronization or understand hadronization either um, using the fragmentation process that we uh, that, that in, in E plus E minus collisions, uh, where we use phenomenological models that are based on uh, parameterizing um, uh, LEP data, uh, such as E plus E minus data. Uh, so these are not um, uh, uh, models that are uh, obtained for using first principles, but rather uh, use input from the data. But another way uh, hadronization can occur, especially in high, high parton density environments, such as in the presence of QGP, is when partons, uh, which are in close phase space, can come together and recombine uh, to form hadrons. And this, would, this, is, this could be uh, more dominant at low PT. Now, depending on what's the mechanisms uh, of hadronization, we would expect um, the, the momentum distribution and also the azimuthal anisotropy uh, to be modified based on the hadronization mechanism. And we also would see uh, an enhanced baryon production uh, when if there is recombination effect compared to these uh, E plus, E minus uh, uh, fragmentation uh, process. So we can use uh, heavy flavor baryons such as lambda C and compare it to D mesons to study these hadronization mechanisms. So if we take the ratio of lambda C over D0 as a function of PT, uh, we see that in, in heavy ion collisions, for example, in more central lead lead collisions, we see this enhanced production of lambda C uh, compared to D mesons um, with respect to proton-proton uh, uh, collisions. So the proton-proton collisions are shown in, in blue points here which already you see uh, it to be different from what we expect from uh, E plus E minus uh, collisions. So even in 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 proton proton collisions, the hadronization mechanism is not this is not similar to what what we see in E plus E minus. But in the uh, in the QGP environment, with, which has much larger uh, parton energy density, uh, these uh, the the uh, baryon distribution looks different. And if we compare with models that include these recombination effects, uh, we see this enhanced uh, production to be well explained uh, by these recombination effects. So this um, brings to my summary, I think I'm on time. So I hope I could convince you that heavy quarks are excellent probes to study the properties of uh, quark gluon plasma. And we, uh, we know that now heavy quark uh, undergoes interaction and also uh, interact with the medium and undergoes uh, energy loss uh, in the medium. And we see a mass hierarchy uh, in the energy loss. While charm quark uh, participates in the collective expansion in the medium by interacting strongly, with beauty quarks, we, we still do not have a conclusive uh, understanding of uh, uh, the interaction uh, mechanisms. And by looking at some of the, uh, some initial study of jet fragmentation and hadronization, we see that these are modified in the presence of the, of the QGP. So there are several new heavy flavor measurements that we can anticipate at uh, run three and run four at the LHC, but also at RIC using the uh, new S Phoenix uh, experiment. So we have very exciting times uh, ahead. So just to just show you uh, what we can expect at LHC, uh, for run three, uh, the ALICE experiment have uh, undergone several upgrades to its detector, and this will allow us to make more precise measurement, including beauty hadrons. 
and both uh, and and let's see we also has undergone some uh, uh, some upgrades where we can uh, perform more precise uh, charm uh, measurements at different center of mass energies while for run 4 we expect upgrades for the atlas and uh, cms uh, experiment these are also targeted uh, to measure heavy flavor and heavy flavor jet measurements at rick we have the new uh, s phoenix um, experiment which is which will also perform uh, extensive heavy flavor uh, uh, particles including b jets and also perform full b reconstruction uh, not just looking at the bk uh, dk particles so more into this uh, you will hear uh, from jamkele in the in the next uh, talk uh, that's okay. all okay no? thank you very much um uh, so we have uh, 15 minutes left. So far, our audience has been a bit shy with the uh, questions, uh, but uh, there's one. So I, I don't know if Yenji wants to read the question. Um, but uh, please, and we have 15 minutes left for discussions. And now is really your chance to ask some uh, uh, detailed questions and get some uh, inf in insightful answers. Please. Yeah, so there's a question on slide number 19. So why does the D meson lose more energy than B uh, at the intermediate PT, but not at low PT? Yeah, okay. So at low PT, um, there are uh, more effects that goes on. So it's not just, we, we don't learn about just the energy loss uh, at low PT. So there are uh, in, um, the 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 pattern distribution functions are modified, so that has to be taken into account, and it can affect the charm production and beauty of, uh, beauty production differently. Hadronization uh, is also a mechanism that that we would see at low PT, uh, and it, on top of it, uh, the the particles that lose energy will go into low momentum particles. So there are several effects that play a role at at low PT. So it. Uh, it would be very difficult to uh, disentangle one effect over the other at low PT. But at high PT, we clearly see this energy loss mechanism where other effects are uh, much uh, smaller. And here, the energy loss is the dominant effect. And, and then we clearly see this uh, mass dependent energy loss. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Okay, I mean, there's a thumbs up on the on Slack, so uh, presumably. Okay. Are there any other questions? Again, we have uh, we have quite a bit of time left for uh, discussion. Maybe we have about. And we could also take the talk later after Jamikele's talk as well if there are questions for this talk uh, in case if that helps. If people want to think over. Yeah. Or if you want me to clarify uh, anything that I that I spoke, which I went much faster, if you want me to uh, re-explain or go a bit in detail, just let me know. I can do that as well. Maybe I'll stimulate this question, Deepa. They go into the uh, discussion of exactly how experimentally uh, we can select this B to D0 versus the regular D0. Like, yeah. How, so, what, what would you reconstruct the, maybe the, the, it's like a tertiary vertex, right? It's not just the secondary vertex, you get another vertex. Yeah, so uh, here, uh, now what we, what is done is to um, uh, uh, reconstruct the D-mesons and then uh, use um, uh, some techniques to see a larger uh, decay length um, for D-mesons, for, for non-prompt D-mesons compared to D-mesons. Uh, we don't reconstruct the, the tertiary vertex uh, yet because we, we cannot do that now, but um, maybe with IT. The run run four, uh, we we should be able to run three. We should be able to separate out the the prompt and non prompt by the by seeing uh, a different or a, a larger um, separation of uh, the the vertex the, the the production vertex or decay vertex itself. But currently, what is done is 
to use the 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 distance uh, between the secondary vertex, um, and we know that this would be longer or larger. The distance would be larger for for BD case compared to uh, D mesons or for the prompt case, and use different techniques such as BDT to optimize the selection to to enhance uh, the B quark. Uh, the, the mesons coming from the quarks rather than the prompt one. And that will be a that will be varying as a function of PT also, right? Yes, the, yes, yes. I guess total momentum because the yes. mass is also different. Yeah. Yeah. So these optimizations are done as a function of momentum. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another question, Yanja. Yeah, so can you comment on the past dependence uh, energy loss of the heavy quark, uh, specifically why a uh, high PT flow is related to past lens uh, uh, energy loss? That was the question. Okay, so um, th this, this collective expansion of the medium uh, uh, and the hadronization effects uh, would be expected uh, is expected at low PT. At high PT, the particles are expected to just go through, right? So they they using the same analog analogy of this uh, flow of the of the water to throwing a rock. If if the rock is um, uh, is it's faster, or if we throw it at a much faster velocity, it would just go through. It it doesn't interact with the medium. So at high PT, the V2 is not from this collective expansion, but rather uh, uh, this um, uh, the difference in the path length would lead to uh, an anisotropy. So just imagine, just think about it as, let's say we start with a 2 GV particle at the center. Uh, if, if it travels longer in the medium, it loses more energy. So this 2 GV can, uh, can lose a delta energy uh, in one direction, but a delta dash in the, in the shorter direction where the delta dash would be smaller uh, than the delta. So this would this would mean uh, at a given if we look at one one GV or sorry um, a ten GV particle uh, the, the the because the, because the delta is different uh, we don't see the same number as in the initial stage so this would give this an isotropy uh, uh, in the distribution hence the V two so V two is nothing but the the difference uh, in, in the particle distribution in one direction with respect to the other. Does that, uh, is that clear? If it's not clear, just let me know and I can try to explain it in a, in a different way. Yeah, Yenji is also transcribing your, your answers on Slack very quickly. Okay, okay. <laughs> and there's someone else is also trying to ask a question. Um, where's the other question? Uh, I saw someone uh, was uh, typing. Maybe it's not fully finished ah. yet. So... Okay. Yeah, somebody's typing, so <laughs> we still have some time. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, while we're, we're waiting, so I just wonder how low can we actually go in the uh, B2D measurement uh, in Alice? Uh, in Alice, uh, yeah, uh, we don't go up to zero uh, PT now. Uh, yes. Uh, we started, if I remember, uh, it should be 2GV. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, so there's another question. Um, so does the mean does that mean a flow of the charmonium is uh, due to past lens, not the hydrodynamic effect? There's a question. Uh, so for for charm, we can we can uh, we, uh, it, it it should be because of the the well we know that it, the V two of uh, charm. Uh, uh, 
is um, is because of the the collective. So if the champ quarks thermalize, uh, um, we we exp we see the V two, and because of the 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 thermalization also and the recombination effects together. While for 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 bottomonium, what we see is we we don't see a V two, and and hence we can say uh, it's not very clear if beauty quarks thermalize in the medium. Uh, and for and the V two that we see for B quarks. Uh, would could be because of the uh, the path length energy energy loss, um, or the V two carried by the the light quarks. And if we have to see uh, the path length energy loss effects for bottomonium, we, we, we should uh, the 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 the, uh, the energy since the energy loss is smaller for for upsilon one s state, uh, we we don't the the effect of this path length energy loss will be much smaller. Um, and but here again, as you see, the the error bars are larger uh, to to, uh, to to say anything. Um, if we look at the number, so if we, let's say at high PT, the V two is around uh, 0 0.05, which is consistent with this uh, high large error bars in epsilon as well. So we cannot uh, conclusively say anything for epsilon, uh, but for charm, um, it's clear that the high PT V two uh that we see is because of the the path length uh, energy loss and which because that, and, and hence we see the v2 to be very similar for the light flavor particles as well okay So are there any other questions? Nope, we still have a few minutes, but not that much time anymore. So if anybody wants to ask a lot, last minute question, please uh, put it on Slack. Or of course we can uh, come back um, to more questions on this talk also later in the, in the morning. Okay, maybe we can uh, give, give people a three and a half minute break. And then we move to uh, the next talk by uh, Jan Michele. Uh, I think we'll just start that one uh, at 10 p.m. Uh, sharp. So thank you again uh, very much, uh, uh, Deepa. And uh, we'll see if uh, more questions later on after people had some time to think. Yeah. Thank you. Deep, uh, I wonder uh, what you think about the the upsilon uh, v two. So right now we see a very small v two, right? Oh, it, it, are you still yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, here, I'm here. Right now, right now we see kind of like you know consistent with zero v two, and and also we see that uh, from the v two d. So as you as we see in the v2 measurement from cns for example right so yeah. the at low pt uh um uh the the b to d v2 is also a lot smaller right compared to d0 yeah uh -huh. um, and also even at high pt uh, you don't it doesn't uh, really um you know go to the to d0 uh magnitude so that's actually also very interesting I wonder, um, in the theoretical models, do they expect, um, you know, 
this uh, flow peak to be at much higher PT because of a larger beauty mass, or they don't really expect any big V2 anyway. Um, uh, and, and, so also, and also there are a lot of complications which could come into play, right? So for the whoops long, because there's a lot of, you know, contribution from the feed down and all those things, right? So if all the feed downs are, are gone, then you are not going to get V2, for example, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in I wonder what this, what is the latest understanding? But maybe this is more for the later talk, but <laughs> just for the fun of it. Yeah, so so one thing that we can say is if, if uh, uh, the models that describe uh, the, no, the, the non-prompt D meson um, uh, and also the electron, uh, the, the transport models, which just uses energy laws, describes, tends to get this, uh, the magnitude quite well. Um, but for upsilon, so it, it doesn't necessarily need thermalization for beauty quarks to describe the, the V2. And even if we uh, assume that uh, beauty quarks are thermalized, in order to see that in upsilon case, we would have to go to much higher PT that, that we do not go yet. So the, uh, the because the V2, hmm, let me see where my... my yes. It's going to be a factor of something like two or three, right? Whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, let me share this slide again. But from the model, it seems to be... Mm. And, and <laughs> even if we, the, the models which, uh, if, if it includes thermalization, uh, the V2 is still uh, quite small. Uh, they, the, 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 for upsilon, it predicts a small V2 even uh, at, the, at, the, at the PT that we have. So for example, here, the two models um, that is compared to the, to the data, the V2 is quite small. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, it's a, an effect that uh, the suppression, first of all, the, the suppression is largely coming from the feed down plus the large mass plus the uh, very detailed recombination contribution. Mm -hmm. so yes. All yes. these three things, uh, which makes uh, things that look mm -hmm. so super different. But that's yeah. interesting. It would be yeah. nice to have a more precise measure. Absolutely. Yes. This is definitely something that uh, we can look forward to in, uh, uh, in the upcoming measurements. Okay. Um, should we move to the next? Uh... Uh, presentation by Jan Michele. Jan Michele, can you try to share your slides? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me know if you can see them now. I'm trying. Oh, I'm sorry. I should share just the slides if possible. Okay. Okay, I can see your slides, although. Um, Okay, now I see a single slide. I guess we're ready then. So yeah. we're happy to welcome the second speaker, um, second experimentalist to talk about heavy flavor this morning. And Jan Michele will tell us about techniques for heavy flavor measurements. And as before, I'll give you a warning in about uh, 35 minutes. Sounds good. Okay, fire away. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks uh, also to uh, to Deepa for the very nice uh, overview she gave. And uh, as Gunther was mentioning, I will focus on, a, uh, on more on techniques and basically trying to, I will try to give you a, an idea of what are the different way of measuring uh, uh, heavy flavor in a drone collision, more in terms of uh, strategies and uh, which challenges come with uh, which uh, strategy. And I will mention uh, in particular in the last part of my talk, some future uh, direction that are related uh, uh, in particular to the study of uh, uh, heavy flavor uh, uh, jet. So uh, the talk will be composed in this way. So I will briefly remind you uh, the introduction, but uh, uh, Deepa already made a great job there. So we can be quite uh, brief. And then I will concentrate on two big classes of, uh, of uh, let's say, 
uh, on the two main strategies that we have to measuring uh, 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 heavy flavor. And uh, the first one are measurement uh, that exploit uh, low PT measurement, which uh, exploit, uh, let's, let's say, minimum bias detector, meaning detector that uh, try to collect uh, uh, as much uh, a minimum bias event uh, as possible. And uh, on the other, uh, the other side is uh, uh, heavy flavor physics in what I call the trigger mode that uh, allow uh, basically to uh, exploit the general pulse per detector and push the measurement uh, up to IRPT. I will then uh, indeed in the last part of my talk uh, connect to the indeed uh, the IRPT uh, physics of heavy flavor to show you how uh, heavy flavor jet and substructure uh, could lead in the future to very big advantages in the study of uh, heavy flavor uh, uh, quenching uh, in heavy ion collisions. Okay, so uh, again, as we have, let me remind you again very briefly, uh, the, the main reason that we find uh, heavy flavor so interesting is because they are produced in vacuum in, uh, and they are producing mechanisms that are fully perturbative. So we can have, uh, we can produce the entire yield in a PQCD calculation. And then they have a properties, they rescatter inside the medium. So if there was no medium, there would basically be no interaction. Uh, what we know is that uh, uh, they lose energy and, uh, and they, by losing energy, we can probe uh, the medium uh, uh, properties. And we have also seen that uh, uh, since they interact so much with the medium, uh, they can be uh, forced to hadronize uh, at the boundary of the, of the uh, hot uh, QCD medium and the hadronization itself can be uh, modified. Uh, what uh, uh, so overall what uh, uh, the, the reason why they are so special is because uh, both experimentally and theoretically they are conserved and traceable meaning that we can uh, reconstruct for example the decays of a d0 uh, uh, and uh, and use it uh, as a proxy for the charm quark and we know that this charm quark uh, uh, to uh, leading order, it cannot uh, be produced uh, in any phase uh, that is beyond the hard uh, scattering. And this is actually, I mean, in this field, we talk a lot about the flavor, but let me just remind you that this is a pretty recent, uh, uh, let's say, revolution. I mean, we have started using extensively heavy flavor for heavy ion just uh, uh, 10 years ago when uh, 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 the luminosity at the LAC uh, became uh, larger and only because we have very good detectors that can re reconstruct the secondary vertex with very good uh, accuracy. So we are really at the early stage of this, uh, of this, uh, 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 this phase and there is actually a lot of physics that we can still extract. So let me start by uh, uh, presenting a few uh, uh, examples of uh, what we can do and how we can do soft uh, heavy flavor physics and why uh, in this case we need detectors that are able to collect as much uh, minimum bias uh, uh, events uh, as possible. And by minimum bias, I am pretty sure you all know, but basically are all adronic collisions. So there is not a specific selection on the type of events uh, that we are uh, uh, collecting. So uh, what is the challenge and what kind of probe we look forward, uh, we look uh, for in this kind of uh, uh, low PT physics? So as uh, Deepa was saying, when we look at low PT, we are basically always looking for uh, soft processes, diffusion or adronization mechanism. And, uh, and the objects that are more in, uh, relevant for these studies are low PT adron, indeed, because they are more sensitive. They behave like a Brownian particle, indeed. Uh, and they are more sen and baryons that are more sensitive to adronization uh, modification. Low PT baryon in particular are, have a very small C tau, therefore uh, is extremely difficult to separate the primary from the uh, secondary uh, vertex. Uh, due to the fact that uh, <laughs> the background becomes so large when you start combining all these tracks, these uh, uh, probes have very low signal over background. And this is, be this is why it becomes extremely difficult to identify while we take data if an event uh, contains a D or a, or a lambda C. And also because you have a lot of uh, uh, charm uh, quarks uh, around uh, in a central LED collision. So we just have to make sure that we have a detector that can separate the primary from secondary vertex very well, and uh, we need to put on tape as much uh, data as possible. So 
so here the techniques that I would like to mention are basically uh, uh, two. Uh, the first one, and this is recently, we have uh, ex started exploring quite systematically machine learning technique that also combined to particle identification has shown to be able to improve uh, significantly the selection performances. And then this is, let's say, the software way. And then the more hardware way is indeed to collect as much data as you can and push the tracking and vertexing uh, performances. As I will show you later, the moving toward a very large sample has imposed uh, to uh, update our analysis technique in terms of data processing, scheming, and analysis. And then, of course, also push for more and more accurate uh, vertexing and tracking uh, technologies. Uh, yeah, so I, let me just give you an example. Again, most of what I'm saying today is biased, and is biased, of course, in the direction of what uh, uh, the analysis that I was involved on, uh, and for which I can give you uh, hopefully some more details in terms of question. But this is just representative of a long list of observable. Uh, one of the uh, one of the best probe for studying this low PT hadronization was uh, the lambda C measurement. And uh, the Lambda C is what drives uh, a lot of the hardware upgrades uh, of Alice, uh, or of also uh, uh, in analogous way also for uh, Phoenix. This is because uh, we want to reconstruct something that uh, uh, travel very short. So typically, uh, the displacement of these objects at OPT are the order of uh, 100 micrometers, and which is very similar to the resolution of the primary vertex. So for a long time, this was not uh, accessible uh, through, uh, through uh, uh, secondary vertex analysis. But uh, the use of machine learning, in particular combining uh, the information with the, uh, the topological selection with the PAD, has allowed us to make a first measurement of this probe even before the run tree upgrade has uh, become available. And this is something that was possible by uh, uh, designing a new way of doing optimization, in particular introducing the tabular data structure, and uh, uh, combined with machine learning techniques, that was also that beca became at some point also the baseline for the run tree uh, software infrastructure. I don't have the time for going into very uh, uh, detailed discussion. But uh, I just wanted to show you that the fact that we can exploit both tracking uh, uh, decay candidate uh, uh, topology and PAD uh, with machine learning technique was actually very critical for uh, expand, extending the study of low PT of lambda C over D0 ratio down to uh, very low PT. This is actually a 50% increase in significance uh, uh, around uh, uh, 4 to 6, 6 uh, G over C. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, use of machine learning technique uh, indeed was uh, 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 critical in the low PT region, and as you know very well, this region is particularly relevant for us because uh, at low PT is where we expect uh, the effect of uh, coalescence of core recombination to be uh, very uh, to be more relevant. This is simply because uh, uh, quarks have to have the time to interact uh, in order to uh, com be combined at the hadronization phase in a in a heavier uh, uh, baryon. So let's say this was how we can uh, cope with this uh, very low signal over background, pushing the software uh, 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 implementation and the software technique. But of course, this is only one way. The second way is the hardware way, uh, which is uh, uh, designing detectors that have uh, uh, better and better impact parameter resolution. And this is what uh, uh, is uh, was done for the run tree upgrade of Alice and also for the uh, first uh, for the tracker of S Phoenix by in, uh, in, uh, employing a new uh, technology of uh, uh, silicon uh, uh, pixels that uh, sub substantially improved the uh, uh, DCA resolution. So basically, by having a better resolution, we can uh, resolve uh, primary to secondary vertex in a much more accurate way. The second key element, as I try to convince you already, is uh, the fact of being able to run at very, very high uh, 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 interaction rate. So basically, to collect uh, all the rate of the LED collision that uh, in at the LAC, for example, is 50 kilohertz. For this one, both uh, Alice and also S Phoenix at Rick has uh, 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 introduced uh, uh, a new readout uh, system for the TPC that is based on Jam. 
and uh, indeed uh, a bit more technical this replaced uh, uh, the gating grid this basically allowed to run without this gating grid system that was supposed to remove all the ions and allows to run a detector a much higher uh, 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 interaction rate indeed re reach, reaching basically 50 kilohertz and the entire luminosity that uh, uh, LAC will deliver so we are going to have a lot more data and uh, 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 with much uh, higher accuracy. And uh, what uh, <laughs> you can expect is that uh, uh, using a brand new uh, system uh, of data acquisition uh, forces you to change also the way in which uh, you reconstruct uh, uh, your data. And in this picture, in this uh, slide, I show you a, a slide, that, a picture that I actually like very much. So it shows up how the uh, tracks look like in the TPC uh, when we will run LED -le in uh, uh, run three uh, with Alice. And uh, one of the key elements of the, of the gem is that they force you to run in uh, what is called untrigger mode. So you are not uh, really being able to, uh, being, uh, you're not able to uh, resolve event by event, but what comes out of the detector is basically a screenshot of uh, a given amount of uh, 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 time in which all the tracks from different collision are all uh, 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 put together. So we go from an uh, event by event uh, analysis strategy uh, to a, a continuous uh, readout uh, uh, mode. And as you can imagine here, there are many challenges uh, that, is, that is even beyond having a lot of data to process. The biggest challenge is that you have to be able uh, uh, to associate uh, in a good way tracks uh, to vertices. And this in a, in a very high density environment like the uh, TPC can be very challenging and, and can also lead to uh, uh, additional technical problem like uh, uh, being able to operate the TPC in an environment in which there are a lot of ions uh, coming from different collision. This is the problem of distortion fluctuation that I will not have the time to cover, but of course uh, I'm happy to discuss with you if you have uh, any question. So what I show you so far is that you can take more data, you can have high resolution, but then you have to be able to deal with it. And deal with it means designing a software infrastructure that allows you to, to, to process this kind of event. I will give you a few details of this, uh, of what uh, actually means, uh, taking the example of the Alice Run3 uh, upgrade to which I, I, I contributed. And uh, uh, okay, so I, I told you before that basically there is not event by event association. So it's important that you are able to uh, uh, to move tracks uh, from one event to the other in case of need. And uh, this actually forces you to change from an event-based uh, data structure to a tabular data structure. Basically, the data both at reconstruction and at the analysis uh, look like a long table in which you identify the event only by just uh, using indices. And the, 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 the software that is called OSquare, at least in Alice, was designed to operate with tabular data format that also allowed to be, to be able to uh, process uh, uh, data more efficiency, efficiently, and was also uh, this designed around the core uh, requirement of having an extreme data uh, reduction already while taking the data. And this is why we call uh, uh, the software uh, offline to online uh, data processing system, because a lot of what was traditionally done in the previous experiment only at offline is at offline level is already done while uh, we take the data. And uh, actually, so let me just uh, uh, sketch the main step of this reconstruction. So there is the first step that is indeed done while we take the data that is called synchronous reconstruction. And here the idea is to perform a first reconstruction and calibration in order to uh, identify, uh, perform some first tracking and vertexing in order to have uh, uh, associate tracks uh, with, the, with the collisions. And, uh, and this uh, gives uh, a data format 
there is a factor more than 50 smaller than the original data in which only a subset of the cluster that were used to produce these tracks uh, are, uh, are, uh, are saved. So we basically uh, saved, let's say, the proto track with the clusters uh, that, are, uh, that were used and there are around. So this allows us to reperform the tracking, but uh, uh, saving a lot of space uh, in terms of uh, uh, cluster storage. Then in a, uh, a synchronous step, so basically shortly after the data is taken, there is a second round with the final calibration. Here we can be a bit more aggressive. And uh, as an output of this uh, uh, step, we have uh, what we call AOD, that are uh, uh, basically a first approximation, the list of all the tracks that were reconstructed, uh, associated to a list of all the primary collision uh, uh, interaction vertices that were that came out uh, uh, from the reconstruction. So these are also uh, tabular. So they are they are flat table, uh, and that were that are then injected into the analysis uh, framework that respect this tabular structure. And there is what uh, is used uh, will be used uh, to take uh, to obtain the latest the the let's say final uh, uh, distributions. So this is a general structure that uh, uh, Alice uh, will adopt. And, uh, uh, but what we had to deal with was uh, also something specific to the AV flavor analysis. As you can imagine, having this huge amount of data, so we are talking about 100 times more data with respect to uh, RAN2, uh, comes and with actually much lower PT reach. So with even an increased combinatorial because, uh, 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 because uh, due to the improved resolution, we can push the measurement to lower PT. So means that this means that we had to rewrite from scratch the way in which we build uh, two prong three prong candidates how to skim the data and how we perform the analysis because we simply don't have hundred times more uh, computing resources to cope with the factor hundred of uh, of collected data. So I'll give you just a few ideas. So also this is the uh, this is a structure that we design in terms of flat table. Actually, we are using. Uh, Apache Arrow uh, uh, tables that are also directly compatible with uh, with uh, with Python. So uh, we put a lot of effort to optimize the data format in order to minimizing the storage needs. Storage is the biggest problem that uh, uh, experiment like Xphoenix and uh, Alice has have, have to cope in terms of a flavor. And in particular, we design a system that. Uh, 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 allows to store only the indices to the track and on the not the full list of uh, track or the loot of candidate in order to have a the smallest amount of data that you save permanently on tape. And then it's also made uh, ex uh, with the idea of being able to run both offline and online. And in particular, this is what we are doing uh, for the proton-proton uh, data. So we are running this uh, while the data uh, have been taken or just a short delay in order to make uh, 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 select uh, in a semi-online manner the event that contain a uh, heavy flavor uh, uh, candidate or a heavy flavor jet uh, a candidate. And then, of course, uh, for it, their, its own nature, meaning that is based on uh, arrows, is uh, directly uh, uh, connect, can be directly connected to uh, machine learning processes like pandas, uh, 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 TensorFlow, or uh, any kind of uh, Python-based tool, tool that you can uh, imagine. So this is actually uh, what I uh, a few uh, challenges and a few strategies that uh, uh, we will use as IAB flavor community to cope with large minimum bias sample. The second type of uh, 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 observable and technique that I will try to uh, present you now uh, relates to the study of IRPT. So basically, what how we could push the measurement of I, of AV flavor up to IRPT and expand it to beauty using uh, a different strategy. So exploiting, uh, let's say, general purpose experiment like CMS and Atlas uh, and uh, using their technique uh, of triggering and reconstruction. And uh, um, here what I wanted to uh, uh, present are indeed briefly the challenges. Clearly, we want to extend to IPT. 
Uh, and but also what we want to do is to have detector that can uh, give us a good calorimeter information because uh, if you want to study the full energy of the jet this is extremely important and also to push for new observable like beauty hadron that back then uh, were not uh, available by the study of uh, fully reconstructed hadron uh, uh, decay which is actually still not yet uh, uh, possible uh, uh, with the, the, the current uh, experimental apparatus it will become available now uh, uh, in Alice and its Phoenix down to low PT uh, just in the, in the coming months. So, and as I say, we exploit the general purpose experiment and uh, we, learn all, we learn all what we could from their trigger strategy to maximize the volume of data that we could collect. So here again, uh, as a personal bias, I will uh, present the, the, the case of uh, heavy flavor measurement with CMS, but of course, uh, 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 analogic attempt were also done uh, by Atlas, for example. But what uh, we have tried to do in, uh, in CMS was to exploit the best of, uh, of this detector, and in particular, uh, uh, perform and uh, exploit uh, uh, dimuon channel to study uh, fully reconstructed the hadrons. Uh, using the, the outstanding new capabilities of CMS, and in particular, try to push the uh, low PT reach of this uh, uh, new system. And on the other hand, to push as much as possible the uh, uh, open AV flavor measurement up to IPT, and also designing a strategy that would un un uh, unlock uh, the study of AV flavor jet. And here in particular, uh, by designing a new set of triggers that allow to uh, uh, study B jet and B0. Adron also in AVI on collision with a system that combine hardware triggers. This is what we call level one uh, trigger system and uh, let's say online uh, heavy quark analysis, both for the reconstruction of uh, the zero or the identification of, of uh, beauty jets. And I would like to give you here a few uh, uh, more details, uh, a couple of more details about uh, uh, the way in which this was actually uh, made. And, and uh, I will start with the case of uh, online D0 trigger. Uh, and, uh, and, and the question is simple here. So how can we use uh, the uh, calorimetry and the tracking to identify how, uh, if uh, there is a D0, IPT D0 in lead, lead collision? And, uh, and the basic principle is that whenever you have an IPT D0, you always have a jet. And we know that jets are extremely powerful when you, when you want to make a fast selection uh, uh, at uh, uh, a trigger level, because you don't have to reconstruct combinatorial, you just look for uh, energy in the calorimeter. So this is the strategy that we design. So uh, uh, the first uh, uh, step is that uh, you go into the calorimeter uh, at, uh, and you check for clusters of, of energy. And one of the step, one of the important steps that we could make in 2015 was to perform a, a, a background subtraction. So basically having a much more accurate way of identifying this level one jet. And for these events, when we when we have uh, the level one decision was positive, we could perform a full track reconstruction and uh, and uh, D zero reconstruction at uh, uh, high uh, level trigger, basically uh, uh, on, on, on offline, uh, sorry, an online D0 reconstruction. And this was critical because back then events, only mean bias event uh, uh, could be stored. And instead in this way, we could push uh, of a substantial, uh, of increase of a substantial factor, the rate of IPT D0 and as well uh, the jets. So uh, a, a quick, uh, uh, a couple of details on what the level one trigger upgrade uh, uh, meant and why it was important. So I, I will not give you the big uh, all the details of this, pro of this project, but the idea was uh, to have a system that allowed to process the entire calorimeter information in one single board. This was not possible before, and it prevented, for example, from uh, estimate the average energy in, uh, in the calorimeter and performing a background subtraction uh, procedure. So this was actually critical for, uh, for uh, increasing the rate of low PT and IPT jet in AVI, ion, but it was also very important for uh, the CMS proton proton program because it, will, it allowed to perform online pileup subtraction for jets. So uh, very briefly, this is the, uh, I think Deepa already showed it, 
but I want to show you how the uh, the, the the measurement uh, benefited from from this technique uh, at low PT uh, minimum bias events were used and at IPT we could expand the uh, reach of uh, of the zero trigger basically at 200 GB mostly uh, due to the use of IPT trigger and this was actually important to see how the uh, energy loss evolves uh, when going to a more energetic probe. Uh, by using also the uh, potential of, uh, uh, of uh, B2 uh, JPSI uh, K on reconstruction, uh, we could also perform back then the first measurement of fully reconstructed B. Plus. This is the blue plot that uh, allowed for the first time to compare B quark and C quark without the need of, uh, of uh, uh, looking at non prompt uh, uh, topologies. And what was actually very remarkable in all this work is that it allowed and opened the field of uh, heavy flavor uh, jet. And uh, uh, as Deepa has mentioned, uh, having a lot of IPT D0 uh, allowed us to study how the direction of the D0 is uh, deflected by the presence of the medium. And this is actually something that is uh, uh, very much connected to the diffusion properties of the of the of the medium. In particular, the more interaction you have, it is more likely that uh, the position of the D0 will be uh, smeared with respect to the jet axis. And this is uh, allowed to make a very first measurement. But what I think is even more important is that it showed that this is a field that can be uh, that opened at the, at the LAC and now also at uh, Phoenix. And another very nice measurement that was enabled by, this, by these uh, uh, techniques was the study of B-jet uh, pair asymmetry. This is the classic uh, delta uh, XJ distribution in which uh, uh, we compare the PT of the leading and the subleading jet uh, with the, uh, the trigger that uh, were implemented. The statistics was sizably increased and it allowed to show that uh, uh, also for beauty jet, uh, the, the asymmetry is uh, increased as a result of interaction with the medium, and that at that PT at least, uh, the magnitude of this uh, uh, modification is compatible for B jet and uh, inclusive jets. So this was important to set, let's say, the PT range in which potentially uh, uh, flavor dependence effect uh, could play a role. Okay. So I hope that you are uh, all still alive after all this many information. So in the last uh, part of the talk, I would like to uh, focus on a few uh, uh, observables that we can exploit in the next uh, uh, few years, in particular related to the study of heavy flavor jets. And, uh, and uh, let me just uh, uh, introduce you why I think this is actually a very interesting field. Uh, because it is the way in which we can combine the power of heavy flavor reconstruction and heavy flavor probe to the fact that jets uh, provide a, 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 a much more dynamic uh, uh, tool for the studies of, uh, of uh, QG, QGP physics. In particular, with these studies, I think we will be able in the next future to characterize in, let's say, in a microscopic way, what is the in medium splitting function, but also have access through the characterization of the splittings uh, to let's say a time space evolution object quenching so i will try to give you a few examples from the past so how we trained for this observable and what we can do in the near future and i will start by presenting uh, a technique that was developed uh, uh, recently that uses uh, uh, d0 meson as a proxy for the c quark this is uh, fully exploiting the power of heavy flavor because uh, heavy flavor can be traced down at any point and we can use them to follow the parton evolution of the charm. This was actually, uh, these are uh, what are called uh, cl reclustering technique that I'm sure you might have heard. What I would like to show you here is that if you can uh, reconstruct the D0, you can basically go back in time in the splitting tree and identify, for example, the, the kinematics of the spur splitting. This, as you know, is a quite an important uh, uh, parameter, is actually very much connected to the splitting function. And uh, what uh, it was shown is that uh, this technique can be used to 
for, to study uh, the ZG. There is indeed the asymmetry of the first uh, uh, splitting. There is one of the models, uh, fundamental uh, ingredients of any uh, PQCD uh, description of the parton shower. This was actually important for constraining it, uh, the C2C uh, glue splitting function for the first time and also provide uh, interesting uh, benchmark for uh, future ABI on uh, uh, measurement. Uh, another way in which jets can be used uh, is to study hadronization. So, so, so far we have used uh, uh, lambda C over D0 ratio or particle ratio to study how the medium modify uh, uh, the hadronization mechanism. But in this case, uh, uh, it was shown that we can use the jets and the jets down to low PT, in particular using charged jets, to measure directly the fraction of uh, 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 momentum carried by an adron in, with respect to the initial C quark. And this is actually a new tool that can be pushed to, to test uh, uh, as directly as possible the fact that the uh, 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 splitting function are, uh, are uh, fragmentation functions, sorry, are modified in adronic uh, collisions. So in the, yeah, thanks, uh, Gunther. I'm, I think I can. Okay. Yeah, so there's a question uh, on Slack. Uh, do you want to take it now or at the end? Yeah, yeah we, ca we can take it now, yes. So uh, there's a question on the D0 jet radius dependence measurement. The D yes. uh, uh, range is very wide, 4 to 20 GB. Is, is this the only measurement we have? Or uh, uh, there are more for smaller bin size? which PT yeah. range can be ideal to see the maximum effect. Yes, so that, if I now try to recover my screen, but yes, okay, that was of course uh, a first measurement that uh, uh, was limited by statistics. So uh, of course uh, it would be better to have a much Okay, your sound seems to be uh, somehow breaking up and also uh, distorted. Um, just, just to, uh, is that just me or it's, it's for everybody? No, no. Uh, okay, ah. so I, I think uh, I, I was ready for it. So now I, I'm. Can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah. Now okay. it's better. Okay. Sounds good. Then. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I, I try to uh, answer the question while uh, fixing this problem. So maybe uh, just let me know if, uh, if it was uh, uh, reasonably clear. I can also take the slide to, to show the... No, I, I think it would be good to, to repeat the answer because we couldn't hear ah, Yes. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so definitely it would be better to have more uh, PT beans, but this study was uh, back then limited by statistics. And of course, by the by the by the high background. So I think for the, the best uh, PT range would be uh, let's say something from four to uh, six uh, six to eight uh, GV, where we know that uh, diffusion processes are still uh, uh, very uh, relevant. And hopefully, with run three and four data, uh, this could be uh, this will be done. I don't know if this is a, uh, this was better. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. So I have still a few uh, minutes. So I wanted to just uh, mention a couple of new observables uh, that we have uh, developed recently. And uh, uh, I think that uh, in the next talk, we will hear a bit more. But uh, uh, what I, uh, of course, what is obviously interesting for us is to continue in the si on the size of uh, uh, characterizing the splitting function. As you know, this is uh, actually one of the most uh, fundamental uh, thing that we can measure when considering jet quenching maybe and collision. 
And the idea would be to exploit the same technique uh, both with fully reconstructed D0, but also with C tagging and B tagging in order to be able to see how the splitting function uh, is uh, modified. And in this uh, respect, uh, measurement at uh, both at the LAC and as, as Phoenix uh, could provide a very strong constraint uh, for theoretical calculation. Uh, in addition to study C to C glue and B to B uh, gluon, uh, recently also the studies of, let's say, next two leading order splittings like the glue to C, C bar has been tried. And this is a, a work that uh, we have done uh, last, uh, shown uh, last year. And the basic idea is that uh, one can identify uh, glue to C, C bar uh, splitting to see how the medium can interact and modify the splitting function. What is actually very remarkable here is that the splitting function has, a, has less divergences because it's simply there is a massive element in the game. And therefore, one can, we have shown that we, characterize, we can characterize the splitting function on a theoretical basis in a very accurate way. And uh, what is uh, actually very remarkable is that uh, we are seeing two new effects. I mean, one uh, is actually pretty known. So what happened is that uh, the CC bar get, uh, uh, get uh, uh, through some scattering. And so the KT uh, get bigger. This is just broadening. But we've also seen that by studying this kind of uh, phenomena and uh, processes, we have access to a new way of uh, studying quenching. In particular, we see that through the interaction with the medium, the gluon can acquire virtuality and therefore the uh, probability of splitting can, uh, can increase uh, uh, of a uh, significant amount. And we can study this, uh, for example, by looking at the double C tagged uh, jet uh, in heavy ion collisions. And this is actually uh, briefly uh, in the talking about strategies and how, what kind of technique we will have to develop. I think this is quite relevant. So if we could study the ratio between a CC bar tag jets and the inclusive jets, we would basically for, uh, for factorization effects uh, be sensitive to the glue to CC bar splitting. And uh, even already with run two and run three data, this would allow to uh, uh, most likely have an access to the uh, glue on to CC bar enhancement. So this is, I think, uh, uh, one example, but there are many and most likely something, something else will be discussed later to show how the development of new technique uh, could have a strong impact on, on the, our physics. And, uh, in, uh, uh, and, uh, and by studying topologies in which we have full control on the final state, we will also be able to go much uh, beyond looking at uh, uh, yield and, uh, and probability of splitting. But for example, uh, we could uh, use uh, the uh, formation time of the glue to CC bar to study how the interaction vary as a function of the uh, in medium path length. And this is, uh, I don't want to get in too many details, but this is what would be very important to study uh, the uh, KT broadening. That is something that was predicted long time ago, but was never really observed in a, 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 an ambiguous way uh, in ADN collisions. So what do we need for uh, doing all the, uh, this uh, uh, interesting substructure study with heavy core? I think that what is really important is that we learn how to deal with the uh, uh, tagging, uh, learning from our friend in, uh, uh, in our energy physics. And in particular, uh, if we could develop DNN uh, tagging uh, that uh, allows to tag not only the C and the B, but also the CC bar and the BB bar uh, component, we would really enable a huge and large new class of observables from uh, uh, DIE-C jet, DIE-B uh, jet, but also, also uh, the possibility of correlating C-jet uh, with photon. This is mostly because by tagging and not by reconstructing an hadron, you have a strong increase in the statistic that you can uh, uh, sample. And of course, I think this is a challenge for uh, experimentalists and also a pretty uh, interesting uh, machine learning challenge uh, where we are learning a lot, uh, both on the, on the uh, PP side and also in the future from the ADIs. So I come to my conclusions. So um, I try to show you a few areas in which uh, uh, different techniques were uh, capable of pushing very much uh, the physics uh, out of, of our uh, heavy flavor observable. And uh, I think that uh, uh, since we are in a Jetscape meeting, I use the opportunity to uh, 
make some uh, uh, comment about uh, uh, ways in which we can maximize the impact of heavy flavor observable. We are going to have a huge amount of very high, uh, very high precision data. And uh, I think that one of the key elements is uh, to be able to uh, uh, have uh, accurate phenomenological models and simulation. And what I think is one of the challenges is uh, to have a, a calculation that can provide a reasonable description of both the soft uh, interaction like diffusion, but as well as a, a IPT heavy quark interaction like in medium splitting functions. And this is something that we need if we want to make the best of heavy flavor jets, substructure, correlation, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, so basically by combining the best of jet measurement with the best of heavy flavor measurement. And here, I think that uh, Jetscape can, be, can play a very important role, in particular, if we can uh, uh, build a very good chain uh, of simulation for every quark, and also in supporting, and it will be a critical role in supporting jets and the future heavy flavor jet measurement over the next uh, 10 years. And thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I cannot hear anyone. If, uh... Yeah, so tell me, Kitty, there's a, a question earlier uh, on the syn synchronous. Oh. Uh, synchronous. So, sorry, I was I was muted here. So uh, ah, go let's ahead. first thank uh, Jamie Kayla in case uh, for that uh, very nice overview, and hopefully we'll get a few more questions. There's still 15 minutes left, uh, so now's your now's your chance. Yeah, so there was a question on the what you mean by uh, synchronous versus asynchronous in the take out, taking part. Maybe you can explain yes. that some more. Yeah. yeah. OK, I think it's this. So <laughs> uh, synchronous and asynchronous are just a, a, um, a way to describe when this reconstruction is made. And uh, synchronous just means uh, you do it while you take the data. Uh, so uh, this is really while uh, we are taking the data, uh, uh, the, the, uh, a large amount of reconstruction is already made. So uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's something very close to an online trigger uh, system, but with the difference that we don't select event, but we reconstruct them. And asynchronous uh, is something between online and offline because it is done uh, 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 just a, uh, very close to the data taking. So, uh, but is not done uh, five uh, weeks after. And the reason is the following: you have to do it as soon as possible so that you can free the data disk. Uh, the disk. So what happens is that you have a lot of uh, 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 a, a lot of data coming from the synchronous reconstruction. What you want to do is uh, within the, uh, let's say, 10 hours to, or a few days maximum uh, to process them, make sure that everything is good, and then save already the final uh, result, which are tracks. Otherwise, the, the problem is that you will not have space for keeping on accumulating more uh, data. So this is why uh, people came out with this synchronous versus asynchronous uh, 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 definition. Uh, Yenji, do you see any other uh, uh, question? Um, not right now. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions uh, to Johnny Kelly's talk. Yeah, currently I see no other questions. Yeah, maybe maybe I can indeed uh, ask uh, uh, um, if 
yeah, I'm, I would just basically want to stress again the, again the point that I try to make in this slide and also for future discussion on uh, ENG. So I think that on our side, it would be very important that uh, uh, we do some effort in, uh, for uh, including and testing as much as possible heavy quark uh, in Jetscape. Otherwise, uh, most of the heavy flavor uh, jet measurement, which will be many in the future, uh, will come without uh, any theory guidance. And uh, you know very well that uh, uh, this is a very, very uh, complicated field in which uh, just also for historical reason, the communities are a bit separate and uh, low PD and IPT. So uh, this, uh, it would be very good if at some point also during this school, there would be the opportunity of, uh, I mean, we will start now with the next talk, but uh, to see how this can be made uh, improved, uh, if, how can it be improved over the next years? Maybe if already somebody has some comments, or I guess uh, it would be happy to hear. Yeah, I don't see any other questions, but uh, don't be shy if you have anything, uh, just post it. Yeah, so maybe you can talk a little bit about slide number nine. Uh, so so we can see in slide number nine, um, the the PP um, lambda C to D zero ratio is already changing as a function of PT, um, and and also yeah, so 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 this means that this ratio is actually not fixed as a function of uh, transverse momentum already in PP collision, right? So uh, so what is actually the latest, uh, greatest understanding of this effect? Modular well, the, I, the different ways. I think that the latest, uh, I, mean, the, I don't know if I can, uh, I mean, my understanding at the moment is that, uh, um, you know, all hadronic collision are uh, IQCD uh, density environment. So yeah. uh, in a way, it's not uh, surprising that when you go to a low, low PT scale, you start uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, indication that uh, it is not uh, uh, independent uh, adronization. And especially because uh, uh, we know that uh, at least in, if we assume the the, the string model to be reasonably okay in describing what happened. We have uh, uh, color strings everywhere, also in proton-proton collision. So is, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, very reasonable. And in a way, when you go to very low PT, even the uh, factorization scales uh, becomes very much mixed up. So it is, uh, uh, for me, the, the the, the interesting the question that is still extremely interesting is uh, whether the, the 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 still the jump that we see from uh, PP to LED is uh, uh, still connected to a, a, a let's say uh, fully equilibrated uh, QGP or not and uh, or if we are just uh, uh, seeing uh, some convolution of uh, PT uh, distribution and so on. So I think that what we are, let's say, rediscovering is that uh, they are, there is nothing fundamentally, uh, there are, that PP and LED are very similar. It just depends, is a density uh, difference. 
and uh, whether we need to invoke for the presence of a, a fully thermalized QGP for going from PP to LED, this is still the, 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 the question. But uh, we know that PP have a lot of uh, uh, strings, they have beam remnant, and uh, I think this is not something that uh, should surprise us uh, anymore. It's becoming, uh, to me, the point of understanding which uh, description holds uh, in which uh, uh, multiplicity and energy regime. But okay, that is, I don't, I don't claim it to be the better understanding, it's just how I see it uh, at, the, at the moment. Yeah, I, I think it would be very interesting to understand whether the lambda C to D or ratio has any dependence on the number of uh, amount of underlying event uh, in uh, PP correlation. Um, for example, the transverse uh, multiplicity dependence. Yes, so I think that the the, the nice one uh, nice step that I've seen recently was the study of the lambda C hadron correlation uh, that was shown a few months ago. Okay, now I'm getting confused. Probably uh, several months ago in uh, in one of the last conferences is not yet uh, what you are asking for, but uh, is at least a way in in which you can start adding some. Uh, geometry in the and geometries versus momentum in this game so basically just going beyond the total multiplicity but uh, going and see what is the effect of the surrounding hadrons yeah uh, i think that uh, definitely what you suggest is the is the is the way to go and uh, and there are some steps uh, in that direction uh, of course uh, if i can if i can just make a last comment things get extremely complicated because, uh, uh, I don't know, I can mention my experience with the fragmentation function. At some point, uh, if you imagine that uh, the parton uh, uh, fragments could uh, interact with, let's say, the soft environment, then the definition of underlying event becomes almost arbitrary because uh, let's assume you want to make some background subtraction of the jet, but what are you subtracting at a given point? if? Uh, if the uh, medium can interact with the fragments, then the jet definition becomes uh, uh, less uh, defined. And, and this is why, because we are pushing this uh, factorization scale uh, in a region where initially it was not meant to be. At least that is how I, I see it. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that makes sense. Uh, there, there's a question about, uh, could either of the speaker comment on the heavy favor diffusion RAA or V2 in a proton lab? Uh, yes, I think that I don't have the plot. Heavy favor, uh, heavy, but... heavy favor uh, uh, we are referring to the heavy favor um, diffusion RAA or V2. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what is the uh, question, but maybe uh, I can try to interpret it is in in one way, and the uh, person that then made the question can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, I guess that one question that could arise is, is whether, let's say, a diffusion description can hold in PLED collisions. I think this is one of uh, 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 the, the big ch challenges in a way, or in a broader sense, if uh, diffusion is something that we can apply to uh, small systems. Uh, uh, Please complain if this is not uh, what you were asking for. But uh, my my understanding at the moment is that this is a pretty unknown territory because uh, the models uh, that uh, diffusion works uh, when there are given constraints in terms of path length. So you need to have a lot of rescattering. So that is probably not a condition at all uh, in uh, in PLED collision. Although we have seen a lot of indication that. Uh, even hydro models uh, seems to seems to work. So the this is something that I've been trying to to understand for a long time. And what I know is that uh, calculation are not ready for that. And uh, and the fact that they are ready not ready is also not surprising because the underlying condition for for that uh, to happen are 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 really really uh, tight. Uh, so. Um, but I, my hope uh, is that uh, when we, we new data, 
uh, we will be able to study these uh, uh, at least uh, collective properties of AV quarks down to lower multiplicity and uh, get a sense of how much we can push uh, that diffusion description in a small system. But I see a raise then maybe, uh, maybe uh, 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 we get... for ah. clarifying the me? question. Yes. No, I, so my question was very general in the sense that, okay. um, <laughs> Uh, what can you say experimentally? I, I agree with your theory is way behind on this, but what can we say experimentally right now about either of the three things, the soft diffusion, the, the energy loss, or even any kind of azimuthal asymmetry for C or B related observables in, in PLED? Okay, so, okay, so this is most... Okay, yeah, so, so what we can say at the moment is that there is no sign of quenching, but this uh, is not a heavy flavor uh, uh, evidence only, it's a overall uh, evidence. We don't see sizable indication of, P, uh, of quenching in PLED or EPP. One can ask, argue whether this is surprising or not, but okay. And for the part of the flow, what we know is that uh, at uh, high multiplicity, uh, uh, there is there are indications that charm uh, uh, show elliptic flow. Then it's very important to distinguish between uh, show a sign of elliptic flow from the uh, statement of saying there is collectivity, because uh, we know that we can have flow without collectivity. But the current understanding is that charm seems to uh, seems to be reasonably uh, uh, well uh, understood in terms of. Uh, some kind of uh, uh, final state interaction in some kind of expanding medium. Uh, the, 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 uh, while beauty uh, seems to be more uh, challenging. So um, at the moment, this is, this is what I, what I uh, think is, uh, is solid. But I would make statement in terms of uh, elliptic flow or of, of triangular flow, whether before getting into the point uh, if this is a, a, an ambiguous indication that charm is flowing in the uh, collective sense or beauty is flowing. But clearly the mass of the B versus the C is critical. And that I think where a lot of measurement uh, will, will, will pop up uh, in the next future because we see that there are very strong differences and something in between the two mass scale is a change in the, the, the game. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we don't know if there's diffusion, but we definitely see a V2 uh, yes. uh, after subtraction for the chunk, but not well established for exactly. right? And uh, there's no indication of any deviation from unity for the R, AA, or QP lab. Or PA. So everything. So- Yeah, I think that you made a very good distinction between final state interactions, we know that they are there, but uh, asking for diffusion is a, uh, is a strong statement because uh, you are making a very uh, clear assumption on the theoretical description. So I, I, I don't think, uh, I would phrase the question uh, in the sense of uh, are models that describe the medium in terms of uh, a uh, diffuse, uh, diffusing particle uh, good enough to describe that kind of system. Uh, yeah. Because it's a, really a matter of applicability of the model, because you can, things can work for many reasons, but they, they can also be completely meaningless. So that's, that's, that's uh, yeah, sorry, Yanji, go ahead. So Jamie Kelly, I mean, can you, can you explain uh, to us uh, what is actually the strongest experimental evidence of diffusion in larger system? In, in larger system, I think it is still the, let's say, it is still uh, to a large extent, uh, for example, for heavy flavor, it would be still the fact that we have a very big uh, uh, V2. And, uh, but uh, it's always, um, it always comes through models. So what we see is that if we have a calculation that uh, does not include uh, 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 an evolution in a medium that drags uh, this charm around, you would not uh, uh, manage to describe the magnitude of the V2, for example. 
but uh, this does not mean that there can be processes that gives you some B2 without uh, assuming the, uh, the charm work uh, uh, in a, being dragged around. So at the moment, I think is the magnitude of the B2, yeah. Sorry. And just to uh, add one more thing, there is, uh, a difference in the behavior within uh, charm and, and uh, JPSI in lead lead versus P lead, right? So we see this V2 mm. hierarchy in, in heavy iron collisions, but not the case. We see the V2 for demesons and JPSI to be similar in, in P lead collisions. Um, so that that's also a point to note that it seems like it's not the same. It need not be a same mechanism in, in heavy iron and, and in P lead. Even at the charm sector. Okay, um, I think we probably uh, need to move to the third talk uh, shortly. I mean, it's good to see that the questions have picked up towards the end, but uh, I think we don't want to take too much of uh, Goiko's time. So yes, I am um, sharing. Good. So last talk in the, the uh, proceedings this morning is uh, a discussion of heavy uh, heavy quark energy loss. On, from the theory side by uh, Goiko, who is now sharing his uh, screen. Okay, so I think we can just go full screen and uh, yeah. uh, get mm -hmm. going. <clears throat> Give me one second here. There we go. Can uh, everybody see my screen here? Okay. Um, so okay, can everybody good. hear me or am I muted? Well, looks good to me. Okay, very good. So basically, yeah, I'll, I'll add up a little bit on what, what was discussed earlier this morning, but mostly what I wanted to do is sort of from the theory perspective, complement what Ishmael has said by highlighting uh, where things change essentially once we uh, uh, are studying heavy quarks, okay? So um, as the title says, I'll be talking mostly about the heavy quark evolution inside of the QGP, but using the Jetscape framework from a more uh, theoretical perspective. So very, very quickly, of course, this is sort of uh, what the Jetscape framework looks like. And the part that uh, we're gonna be focusing on mostly is on this uh, jet showering evolution part, where the framework really allows us to combine different uh, mechanisms for energy loss, be it at high virtuality and at low virtuality. Uh, and in fact, these two uh, processes in principle can talk to one another. So that's one nice thing of the framework. And then the other, the other thing, which is going to be talked about tomorrow, is basically that the Jetscape framework also provides us with a test a set of Bayesian analysis tools to be able to characterize how uh, hard probes, and in particular heavy flavor, interacts uh, with the quark gluon plasma. So this is the quick outline of my talk. So I will do a little bit of a brief overview of the physics in Jetscape, just to make sure that uh, everybody is up to speed. So everybody still sort of is uh, remembering what was talked about on Friday. And then I'll, I'll focus on the two most important modules, uh, matter and LTT, uh, res uh, describing respectively the high virtuality and the low virtuality evolution of heavy quarks. Uh, before I actually combine both of those models and essentially uh, discuss a few of the results that we've obtained with this. And then finally, I'll give a conclusion and an outlook. So let's start with the first part. So uh, a quick reminder here is just to say that uh, if you are having a jet essentially propagating in the, ma in, in the vacuum, that this high virtuality essentially in the vacuum is going to be exclusively lost through uh, a showering that happens solely through irradiation. And then this, this type of radiation is of course simulated in Monte Carlo methods such as Pythia, where uh, except uh, where Pythia in particular uh, actually ends up generating a virtuality, uh, sorry, a, an angular order shower where the opening angle between the, the, the splittings uh, is always reduced uh, as you go further down uh, in the chain. So what that basically does is it, it generates a narrow cone for the jet created in the vacuum. Now, what ends up happening in the medium, of course, is that you have not only radiations, that are present, but you also have collisions, which will essentially enhance this opening angle. So in particular, 
the the scatterings what are going to they're going to do the multiple scattering what they're going to do is they're going to reduce the typical energy of the radiated uh, parton and also open up the radiation angle but also what they will do is that they will allow for a, for exchange for energy and momentum and and in particular particles between particles in the jets and particles in the in the medium so you can pick up as as an example in this process over here a particle from the medium uh, can gain enough energy in such a way that it becomes part of the jet and vice versa, a particle can also lose enough energy in such a way that it gets deposited into the medium, right? So you have an energy momentum exchange that happens in the medium. And then the other thing that you have in the medium as well is an exchange of the uh, flavor composition or the chemical composition of the jet. And by chemistry, I mean here the light flavor chemistry, right? Because the up, down and strange quarks are the ones that are actually thermalized in uh, the quark gluon plasma. And those are the ones that can be exchanged between the jet and the medium, whereas that is not possible for, for heavy flavors because they're not thermalized in the QGP. So what I wanted to do now is essentially go in a little bit more detail in explaining how these uh, scatterings end up affecting uh, radiations at both uh, high, high virtuality and low virtuality by going over the different uh, modules that are present. So the different modules are such that we have matter and LVT, and matter is really sitting in this high virtuality regime where uh, from the beginning of the jet, most of the evolution of, of the, the partons inside of the jets are gonna go through radiation. And during this radiation process, uh, what you will have is basically mostly the virtuality being lost while the energy isn't changes as, as significantly. Uh, and this essentially goes on up until you hit a virtuality scale, which we call the switching virtuality. This is a free parameter that will uh, tune. Uh, and uh, when I get into the results section, and uh, it, it is at this virtuality that you essentially transfer all of the partons from uh, the simulation in matter to a simulation in the LBT sector. Now, in the LVT sector, uh, what you have is that the, the, um, the evolution is essentially uh, most, more happening so in the energy direction because you've essentially run out of virtuality. And in the energy uh, sector, now the proportion of scatterings relative to radiation, so the scattering component becomes quite a bit more important. Um, and then finally, uh, once you essentially reach both low energy and low virtuality, this is essentially where non-perturbative processes come in and all of these partons in this, in, in this shower are, are, are handed over to Pythia for uh, hadronization. So it's really the capability of being able to combine a different uh, uh, frameworks, or, or I should say different models inside of the Jetscape framework uh, that makes the Jetscape framework particularly interesting is that whereas you can, fo you can focus on what, whatever your preferred uh, uh, energy regime or, or kinematic regime in, ends up being, uh, as far as jets are concerned, um, and then knowing that the rest of the the the, the simulation, meaning the hydrodynamical simulations, uh, et cetera, is being dealt with and is, is state of the art, right? So it it, it really allows uh, theoretical progress to happen in a much more quantitative way because you can focus on whatever the, the particular theory you have that you're interested in, uh, whereas the rest is state of the art. Okay, so after this brief overview, uh, what I wanted to dive into directly is discuss uh, how things are happening in the high virtuality domain, in particular inside of matter. So the, the what I want to show, what I want to focus on first here is on on the splitting functions, not so much to uh, essentially describe uh, the, 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 the physics behind the, 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 the splitting function that I'm showing over here, that's already essentially done in a lot of theory books, for instance, in Peskin and Schroeder. But what I wanted to introduce with this slide is essentially a, a set of uh, a terminology and also give you a little bit of information about um, the different variables and how they show up in the equations that I'm going to be showing in, in a couple of slides. Okay. So, uh, this particular split is already, of course, known. So this, if I, what I'm focusing here in particular is for a uh, quark reading off a gluon and, and then, of course, generating another quark. And the kinematic definitions of how things are, are organized is 
First and foremost, what we're going to be doing is that the incoming momentum shear of the of the hard parton, the jet initiating parton, is going to be using um, light cone coordinates that are defined down below here, and of course the virtuality and light cone coordinates of the of 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 any uh, any uh, quark, in particular heavy quarks, uh, is given down below here. Okay, so this gives you some of the definitions of, of some of the variables that are going to be showing up. And then by using energy momentum conservation on the on the the, the, the right hand side here of the split, uh, there you essentially introduce other parameters such as the transverse momentum, so the relative transverse momentum of the two daughters that is showing up over here. Uh, the momentum fraction, of course, is only affecting the plus component of um, the, uh, the the four vector of the, the the quark and the gluon respectively. And then by energy momentum conservation, you essentially end up having the uh, that determines what these components can possibly be. Okay, so now you essentially ha have an over a brief overview of the different variables and how they show up in this split. And later on, I'm just going to be using them. And uh, if you need to re re recall where they were, this slide is going to be particularly useful when you uh, review them later. So the idea here is that in the medium, what ends up happening is that um, for uh, high enough virtualities, uh, the vacuum split is actually not good enough because what you can have is also a scattering that is happening as the split occurs, right? And the scattering can happen. So for, for very high virtualities, you know, the lifetime of this particle over here isn't long enough for multiple scatterings to actually occur. So in particular, uh, there the, the, the first important correction that you should take into account is a single scattering. And that, uh, that single scattering can happen in three places. It can either happen before the split or it can happen in any of the two daughters after the split. And these three diagrams actually end up interfering. Okay, so to give you a bit of more, more information about this interference, the key requirement is that the um, the the partons from the quark gluon plasma, which is carrying the escape perp over here, uh, their uh, form momentum is essentially comparable to the split, the L perp. Okay, so what that basically means is that this is the case. Then the, the medium can actually resolve, so the medium, which is K-perp, so the medium in K-perp can actually resolve the two daughter particles, right? And this is essentially, once you can do that, then this is when the, this interference pattern is going to show up. And what that interference pattern actually looks like is given over here. So uh, so the, 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 the K-X here, basically what's, what, what really this means is that we, we've chosen our axis in such a way that uh, the, the, there's only the X component of the, of the K-perp. Okay, and uh, the interference pattern is as follows. So the, the, the black line over here is if we say that the L perp is 50 GV, and then if the uh, choose the L perp will be 5 GV, that, that's when you get this, uh, this red line over here. And the region here in blue, in both cases, is the region where you have uh, coherent scattering. Okay, so that's the K perp region over which you have coherent scattering. And as you go away from that, the scattering becomes more and more incoherent, okay? For that. So uh, once we essentially know what this thing looks like, let's make it a little bit more quantitative. So what we typically do is we do a Taylor expansion in KPERP. And of course we integrate over KPERP as well. And, and, and performing these operations is essentially what gives you your, your medium modified splitting function where your vacuum piece is over here and, and, and the medium induced piece is this guy here which includes these three interfering diagrams. Now, where the interference shows up is, is, is actually in two places, which are highlighted here in red. Uh, this two minus two cosine piece is the curve that I was showing over here. Uh, so that is one part where you have this co these coherence co effects being captured. And then the second part where these coherence are being captured is in the virtuality dependent Q hat. Now, if we do the same sort of procedure for heavy flavor, uh, the situation more or less remains the same, except for now you acquire mass dependent uh, pieces. And this mass dependence is partly included in the sky parameter, uh, which is defined down below here. So you have an overall mass dependent that sits up front here, right? You still have your two minus two cosine piece, but now uh, the typical lifetime of your parton, which is this tau f here, uh, also now acquires a mass correction. Okay, so you you this the, the so essentially all of the all of the pieces end up being being modified a little bit. You 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 acquire an overall mass dependent piece in front of your splitting function, and as well as as in your denominator here, 
And also you end up with a mass dependent uh, lifetime. Uh, now, the second piece that uh, I didn't really talk about is uh, this: what this virtuality dependent uh, Q hat looks like. So this plot was was essentially yeah. already discussed by yeah, Ishmael. So there's, okay. there's a question. Uh, oh. You want to take it? So does a coherent uh, scattering necessarily mean uh, collinear scattering here? That was the question. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't in general have to be collinear, right? Um, the, 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 the real requirement is to essentially, um, um, have these, these, the, the being able to resolve basically the opening amb angle of the split, right? So it, it doesn't necessarily say that well, after, after the, the scattering has occurred, your particle is, 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 is collinear, right? This is sort of more of a, um, yeah, basically it doesn't say what's happening, you know, either here or here or here. Right, which is what we typically mean when we talk about uh, whether scattering is collinear. It's the collinearity is typically defined after the, the scattering has occurred. Right. Um, so the um, so in general, it, it doesn't have to be collinear now. Um, okay. So to come back to the what I was saying earlier. Uh, so this virtuality dependent Q hat was actually uh, developed for uh, light quarks, light flavor, and it has the typical shape over here, where of course the the the, the more highly virtual the particle is, uh, the the less of these coherence effects that you end up having, right? And then effectively the smaller the Q hat is, right? So the, the, you essentially end up interacting less and less with the medium the higher the virtuality goes, and this has to has to do with the fact that the higher the virtuality is effectively your medium becomes more and more dilute, right? This is a D-blot evolution. So that, that essentially describes why you have this, uh, 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 the shape of the, of the curve for the virtual dependent Q. Now, what hasn't been calculated just yet, although the, uh, the formalism is, exists, is um, so in addition to having this virtuality scale affecting your Q hat, in principle, you should also have a mass scale, the heavy flavor mass scale also affecting what this is. And that hasn't been calculated as of yet. The formalism exists, right? It's soft collinear effective theory. And that soft collinear effective theory, effective theory has been used essentially to calculate what the splitting function looks like. But uh, actually extracting out of this Q hat, how the Q hat ends up being modified uh, through um, the presence of a heavy flavor, right? That, that hasn't been worked out. Uh, in the same in, in the same sense as it has been worked out over here, right, where you have included the virtuality scale as an, a, a new degree of freedom. So we need to do this also for an, an, a second scale, which is the heavy flavor mass scale. Now, the 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 other reason, other than from this theoretical perspective, the other reason why it's important to have a virtuality dependent Q hat is essentially shown here on the left as that it allows you to actually simultaneously describe the two energy regimes that have been explored with heavy ions, meaning the Rick energy regime and the LHC energy regime. So if you didn't have a virtuality dependent Q hat, then you would need uh, different overall normalizations in order to be able to describe Rick and LHC. Whereas if you have a virtuality dependent Q hat, all of a sudden now, this virtuality dependence can nicely sort of interpolate, if you wish, between what's happening at Rick and what's happening at the LHC. So what we're going to be exploring today, basically, is um, how sensitive, to a certain extent, are we to this virtuality dependence. And the way that we're going to be doing this is by splitting the Q hat in, uh, as follows. We will have the usual hard thermal loop expansion, right, which doesn't have any virtuality dependence. And then we're going to tag along, uh, ta attack, uh, attach on it a virtuality dependence that has this uh, particular shape down here. And we're going to be changing these parameters C1 and C2 and essentially see how much that ends up affecting the results that uh, we're going to look at. So the um, so now that we essentially uh, established the, what the splitting function is, then uh, you can take that splitting function and uh, put it inside of either uh, your 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 favorite uh, high virtuality evolution. And in the case of Jetscape, this is matter. Uh, so the, the other nice thing uh, that, about matter that is different, uh, for instance, from Pythia, is that matter actually ends up generating a virtuality ordered shower. Okay, 
So what do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that in Pythia, typically, uh, you would have to determine the virtual, the, the, uh, the L perp, right? Of the, the transverse momentum of the outgoing daughters before you determine the virtuality of the outgoing daughters, right? And in doing so, you are essentially generating a virtual, uh, uh, an angular ordered uh, um, set of splittings. However, in the case of matter, that's not what is done. What we do first is actually determine the virtuality of the daughters before we actually determine the angle or the air perp of the daughters, okay? So um, we are not strictly enforcing this virtual, this angular ordering in the case of matter. What we are enforcing strictly is a virtuality ordering. So that's the, that's sort of a distinction that I would like that, that I wanted to highlight here. So the the way that we end up assigning this virtuality is by, of course, using the usual pseudoconform factor. Uh, what I wanted to highlight today is essentially uh, how this pseudoconform factor. How where does the mass enter, right? So if we look in the in the case, for instance, for the um, uh, heavy quark radiating an alpha gluon. So the word, the place where the mass enters is in the minimum value of the the the, the Q square that you're allowed to explore uh, through through the pseudoconform factor. And also the other place is it ends up affecting the minimum value also of your uh, momentum fraction. Okay, where this Q zero that, that I'm showing in these formulas is just a non-perturbative cutoff scale that uh, beyond, beyond which we don't trust the calculation, right? So your mass ends up also in addition to showing up in your splitting function as I've shown, where is this a couple of slides ago? Let me go back to it very quickly, right here. So in addition you, to your splitting function, having a mass dependence that shows up through these guys, you also have a mass dependence that ends up showing up through these limits, these kinematic limits. Uh, now, of course, a recursive application of the pseudocomfort factor allows you to essentially assign what the virtuality of all of these daughters are. Okay. So in the case of uh, QCD and heavy flavor splitting into uh, uh, um, a quark and a gluon, but basically for that particular uh, diagram, there's only one splitting function, right? Whereas if you think about uh, the gluon, on the other hand, then the gluon essentially has three possibilities in QCD, of course. This gluon can split into two gluons, it can split into light flavor, and it can split into heavy flavors. And you really need to sort of resum all of these uh, contributions inside of your Sudakov to be able to really assign the virtuality of any gluons that are existing in, the, um, in this chain here. Now, the, the reason why I highlight this is uh, for the following is that, although there has been some recent developments in calculating what the splitting function is uh, using BDMPS, uh, for this glue going to heavy flavor, uh, we haven't actually implemented uh, uh, th those studies yet inside of the Jetscape framework. What is actually currently present in there is that we are using a phenomenological sort of approximation uh, where we are using the light flavor spreading functions uh, to, uh, to, to account for uh, glue goes to heavy flavor. But what we are changing on the other hand is we are changing the uh, kinematic regimes that are um, President here. So one of the next things that uh, we certainly want to look into is either to uh, try using the soft collinear effective theory that I've mentioned earlier uh, and calculate. Uh, uh, so the same uh, higher twist sort of formalism that has, was, was used here, we, should, we need to calculate the splitting function to the heavy flavor. Or the other thing that we can do is we can use the BDMPS formalism and try to see again phenomenologically how important is it uh, first and foremost, to include that uh, inside of the, the splitting function before we actually do it more formally using higher twist. Okay. Uh, in addition to this, uh, as I said, because we are we don't have a, a, a Q hat that depends on two scales, namely the virtuality and the mass, we're only going to be using, again, the light flavor approximation here for the Q hat as a function of Q square. So that's another limitation for the time being. But as I said, we're working on improving this. So this is as, everything that I wanted to talk about as far as the splits are concerned. And the next topic, of course, is that matter also includes two scatterings, which are uh, at leading order using perturbative formulas, okay? Um, so this, uh, the, 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 the rates associated with two scatterings are also the same rates. Uh, so matter uses the same rates basically as LBT does. So this was a nice point for me to bridge on to talking about LBT. But before I do that, if there are any questions, 
about this section before I, I start talking about LBT, uh, that'd be much appreciated. Okay, doesn't look like it. So let me then switch gears and talk a little bit more about, about LBT. So uh, as was mentioned before, uh, LBT is essentially uh, valid at very, very high energies. And of course, we are assuming nearly on shell particles. Uh, specifically, what I mean by this is that the virtuality is less than or equal to the switching virtuality, okay? So what LBT solves is actually the effective Boltzmann equation. And what I mean by effective is what essentially I'm gonna be discussing uh, here first. And this essentially has to do with the collisional kernel and the radiation kernel. So strictly speaking, the Boltzmann equation is really valid in the, in the limit where you have a very dilute medium. And basically the, the, the only distributions of particles that you're worried about is single particle distributions. Okay, so any two particle correlations or beyond, strictly speaking, in the in the usual definition of the Boltzmann equation, are not included. Okay, so as far as two to two scatterings are concerned in this collision or kernel, those are perfectly allowed, as you will see in the next slide, because the the the, the, the scattering kernel itself only needs single particle distributions to be able to describe this entire process. Uh, as far as the uh, inelastic uh, contribution is, so this is typically one to two splits. Those in principle should also be fine as long as you require only single particle distribution. For instance, this is the case if you have a decay in the vacuum, right? So if you have scatterings in the medium and decays in the vacuum, then this actually becomes the Boltzmann equation. Where things get a little tricky is in the medium when you have these additional scatterings that are modifying your split. In order to really be able to include this or include these coherence effects or interference terms, you really need to include two particle distributions. Namely, for instance, if I'm looking at this guy over here, this diagram over here, I need to know what the two particle correlation is. Namely, what is the probability of having a K perp given that, I've, that I have a P1 over here? Right? That, that's essentially one of the two particle correlations that would really be needed and that are, uh, that are it, it at least included in the calculation when we calculate the medium correction of, of, of the, the splitting function. Now, these two particle correlations, keeping track of them from a numerical standpoint is a very, very much so costly. So what we typically do is that we do include these uh, medium induced um, corrections to the splittings in the inelastic piece. However, we don't actually keep track of the evolution of this two particle distribution function, for instance, the one that I mentioned before. Okay, so in this sense, this is an effective Boltzmann equation. So now let's uh, go a little bit more and discuss what the, the different ingredients on the right hand side of the Boltzmann equation, namely the collision on piece and uh, the, the first starting with the collision piece, and then I'll talk about the inelastic piece as well. So the, the collision or kernel is essentially given by this equation over here, where you have your usual integral over your space, phase space including your momentum uh, uh, conserving delta function present in here. Uh, the matrix element, of course, is the, the one from leading order PQCD diagram. So this is, uh, can be found, for instance, in textbook like Peskin and Schroeder. And then the new thing that is essentially happening in the medium is that you have these thermal distribution functions. So the expression that I've specifically written down here is assuming that you have uh, both the incoming particles and the outgoing particles being part of the thermal medium, okay? So you first need to figure out what the probability is in a thermal medium of finding a particle of uh, uh, um, uh, momentum P1 and momentum P2. And if the medium is in perfect thermal equilibrium, this will be your Bose-Einstein and your Fermi Dirac distribution. And of course, after the scattering captured by this matrix element, you end up going in the outgoing states. And depending on whether you have bosons or fermions, you will either have poli blocking or Bose enhancement, right? That, that is essentially included. Okay, so that's sort of the, the structure of what this, uh, uh, this thing looks like, okay? Uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that this collisional kernel actually gives you a rate density of collisions, meaning that you would need to integrate both over the momentum and also over the space-time evolution of the coagulum plasma to find the actual total number of collisions of any particular process that you're interested in, okay? So that really is a rate density uh, as opposed to a rate, for instance, that you would have in vacuum of uh, particles, the gains, for instance. 
Now, uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight here is essentially uh, do a quick comparison of this formula and, and its va vacuum counterpart, right? So in the vacuum, basically what we're saying is, of course, any particles that are creating afterwards, they don't have this poly blocking and Bose enhancement, right? So they don't interact with anything that, ha that happens after the fact, after the collision, right? So we just simply set those to one, okay? So if I, so this is set to one, so the entire, uh, th this part of the equation essentially ends up going inside of your cross section. And then the first part of this equation, so to speak, uh, ends up going into your definition of luminosity where your, uh, your, your Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein actually become uh, properties of your beam, right? So that's what, what is the density of the particles that are present inside of the beam. And that's typically on, in, in, in the vacuum in PP collisions, for instance, this is a quantity that you actually measure in experiment that, that, that has to do with your beam properties. Whereas this is the, the, the stuff that you actually have to calculate using, using, using QCD. Okay. So that's essentially the, the other link that I wanted to make here is, is how does this formula compare to what you're familiar with uh, in the vacuum? There it is. Okay. So the other thing that I, I wanted to highlight here is the fact uh, that they, they have a, a, a minus sign in this particular case. And this is essentially to indicate that we are the evolution of this particular process here is giving you the evolution of particle one that actually depletes the density of these particles. And the reason is simple is that you have particles of momentum P1 that end up being depleted because they go into momentum P3 and the same thing for P2 goes into P4. But we're, we're integrating over P2 and P4 so and, and integrating over P3. So this really is a, a, a loss contribution to your collision kernel. Okay. There's also a gain contribution that this effectively is uh, flipping the momenta around. So you would have P3, P4 going into P1, P2, and then you would have, a, have to put a pl plus sign over here. Okay. So the approximately equal piece is because I haven't written on both of those contributions. Okay. Uh, so Ishmael on Friday essentially gave you the full sort of uh, uh, expression, but I wanted to break it down a little bit more here. So when you are actually now calculating this inside of a Monte Carlo, inside of a Monte Carlo, right, you're, you're not actually solving for the full distribution function, right? You're actually sampling it, okay? So, uh, and, and after many of these samplings, if you were to, let's say, average over them, you could actually reconstruct what this distribution function actually is. So because you are running samplings, okay, and you're keeping track of every individual particle as the, as the, as the, uh, as the system sort of progresses, uh, because you're uh, doing samplings, then immediately you know uh, what the, what the, what the uh, in incoming energy and incoming momentum of the, part of the incoming parton actually is, right? Because you keep, keep track of the entire evolution of your, your, of your system up to that point. So there isn't actually a distribution. This is actually one. You know exactly what that is, okay? And you can also say that for the outgoing guy, if I could, if I can sort of integrate out of what's happening with the medium, the outgoing guy is also known, right? And the reason is that, uh, yeah, it, it, it's known because of energy momentum conservation. So the distribution there also is one, okay? So the only two distributions that you have to worry about really, as far as being able to calculate collision or rates inside of a Monte Carlo is the distribution function of particles in the medium. So that, that's P2 and P4. Um, so uh, again, these distribution functions are, 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 are purely quantum and they're being sampled in, in the Monte Carlo setting. And I wanted to also contrast this with the fact that when you actually run hydrodynamical calculations, those are classical hydrodynamical calculations, right? That there, there are no quantum effects in there. So now let's go back and discuss a little bit more about uh, these matrix elements. Well, how, what, how do they look like? So. This is a matrix element that's, that's fairly uh, straightforward to calculate, in particular, Peskin and Schroeder has it. So the matrix elements for this is, is very much known, whereas the matrix elements for these guys is, is, is a bit more involved. And uh, this is why I'm essentially giving you this reference where all of these guys are calculated in, in, in a bit more detail. So now the last piece that I wanted to talk about as far as theory is concerned is what is this inelastic contribution? And this is where our, 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 our uh, friend, the, the pseudocore form factor, if you look at what's happening inside of the exponential, that essentially gives you the probability of these one to two uh, stimulated emission process. So the stimulated emission process here, and then you, have a, you also have a vacuum piece that is present there. 
So now we essentially have sort of, we've gone over all of the physics that is uh, sort of relevant and is complementary to what Ishmael has already explained. So now we can uh, turn off uh, the theory side of things and look at a bit more phenomenology, particularly looking at some results. But uh, before I go there, uh, if there are any questions from, from uh, Slack or from uh, the, the people want to have. Yeah, I don't see anything on Slack yet. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So I have another 10 minutes or so. So that gives me enough time to go over some of the results. So I think uh, everybody's familiar with RAA. That's been a concept that, that has been discussed quite a bit in this conference. I'm not gonna sort of uh, um, go over all of these the, the different bullet points. Uh, and what I'm gonna talk about a little bit more is basically what the, uh, the how do we simulate the medium for this particular calculation that I'm gonna be showing you, right? So there we're essentially, the medium is simulated through these uh, four different uh, simulations. So we have Trento initial conditions, two plus one D three equilibrium dynamics, gives you a non-trivial non energy momentum tensor that you then supply into uh, two plus one D viscous hydrodynamics of the core gluon plasma. And then finally, we convert that into, uh, we convert the fluid degrees of freedom into particles and we run your QMD to basically be able to calculate the, um, the final state observables. And in the software sort of stack, uh, we the the tuning has been done by a Bayesian analysis that was done in 2018, 2019 by the people at Duke. And they were would have essentially uh, extracted with the temperature dependent shear viscosity, bulk viscosity, initial condition parameters, and so on and so forth. Uh, they, those have all, all been tuned. So we're basically the only thing that we're doing is using the maximum of posteriori parameters. So so, so, to, so to speak, the best fit. Uh, for, for these parameters when we run the, the fluid simulations. Okay. So now what I want to focus about is a comparison between charged hadrons and, and D mesons. So D meson RA is sort of presented here on the left, charged hadron RA is presented sort of here on the right. And uh, the point that I'm trying to make in this particular slide is to say that the tuning of all of the parameters was essentially done by just looking at the charged hadrons and therefore D meson RA becomes a prediction. So the uh, now let's look at the different curves in a little bit more detail. So there is essentially three set of curves here. One curve is basically the orange curve, which uses a virtuality depend independent Q hat, right? So this is this hard thermal loop uh, expression that I've shown you before. And uh, both for D, meson for D mesons and for charged hadrons, basically you can't, the, the, the shape of the curve is not correct. Uh, compared to the experimental data. So you, you can't do any kind of tuning in here to be able to describe the data. What is really needed is a virtuality dependent Q hat. And that's what this red, green, and blue curves are showing is that once you include a virtuality dependent Q hat, you can describe both the charge hadrons and the D mesons. Uh, however, uh, beyond sort of a, tr a threshold effect where you sort of, you know, go transition onto a non trivial virtuality dependent Q hat actually uh, constraining the parameters, which is these C1s and C2s, and the formula again, just to remind you, is given down below here. Um, for, the, for the time being with this particular analysis, we couldn't constrain uh, C1 and C2 all that much. Okay? This can also be partly to the, due to the fact that what we're using, uh, what we're doing is using the same Q hat for both light flavor and heavy flavor. In particular in the future, if we were to include another scale in addition to the virtuality scale, a mass scale, this, this, this picture here may, may change, especially in the head of flavor side. The next thing that I essentially wanted to talk a, bit, a little bit about as well is how does the switching virtuality end up affecting RA? So for uh, charged tradrons and D mesons, uh, the effect essentially seem to be similar. And uh, we, are, we, we are essentially varying here three sets of uh, uh, switching virtualities going from uh, Q, uh, Q squared of two GV all the way up to nine GV. Sort of the best bit is at four GV over here, you're seeing. But again, uh, when, 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 we, when we did all of these calculations, uh, the, the, there's again, the caveat of this um, uh, Q hat that has two scales uh, that is not actually present at the moment. So we only have the virtuality scale, we don't have the, the mass scale there yet. 
And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is a sort of uh, in line with what uh, uh, the previous speakers have talked about as well, is the importance of having uh, heavy flavor being produced dynamically in the shower. Okay, so what I mean by this is gluons can slip into heavy flavor. And the question is, how much does, uh, does that affect the, the, the D mesons and the charged hadrons? And in particular, uh, whether, whether or not we, uh, we will be sensitive to this virtual other dependent view head. Okay. So uh, let, let me start by focusing what's happening here for charged hadrons. So the, the results with a virtuality dependent Q hat are sort of over here, and the, with a virtuality independent Q hat are down here. And the calculation without gluons goes into heavy flavor is here, whereas glue, glue into heavy flavor with gluons into heavy flavor is the orange line. Okay. And similarly, uh, without glue, uh, glue goes to QQ bar, that's the, uh, the, the purple, and then width is, is, is the red. Right. So what we see is that if we have a uh, virtual independent Q hat, then we are actually sensitive to glue goes to QQ bar. And this is true for both for charged hadrons and D mesons. And if we now include a virtual independent Q hat, all of a sudden charged hadrons aren't so sensitive, but D meson RAA still is. And in all cases, as you can see down below here, this is essentially a ratio of the, the curve uh, uh, without glue goes to QQ bar over the curve with glue, 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 glue to QQ bar. So the, 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 the purple here is really purple over red, and then the pink really is pink over orange, okay? And what basically what we see here is that we are sensitive to glue goes to QQ bar at a 20% level, okay? So really what we need now is uh, two, two additional things. Uh, we need to have uh, a virtuality dependent Q hat and a mass scale dependent Q hat. And in addition, as I mentioned already earlier, the splitting function of uh, glue goes to heavy flavor needs to be revisited in particular to, to include uh, mass scale dependent effects, either through uh, the, the calculation that Jasmine collaborators have done, Jasmine Brewer and collaborators have done using uh, BDMPS, or even better than this, going in, into the, using the higher twist formulas in such a way that uh, light and heavy flavor are treated equally inside of matter and actually deriving what the splitting function is. But regardless of, of, of these future, this future work on Q hat and on the splitting function, the key message here still remains that if you really want to do studies of, of charm meson um, RAA, you must include dynamical generations of uh, heavy flavor. And uh, this can only be done inside of the Jetscape framework where you have the, the high virtuality piece, which gives you the source of these uh, heavy flavor. And then you have also the lower virtuality but high energy piece inside of LVT that does additional energy loss to this heavy flavor before you actually detect it in, uh, in RA, for instance. So this essentially brings me to my conclusion, uh, where I've shown you a multiscale formalism, really, uh, that is present inside of the Jetscape framework and allows a sort of a simultaneous description of both light and heavy flavor. And in particular, for realistic simulations of charm charm quark energy loss, we must include this uh, other additional process of dynamical heavy flavor generation through gluon splittings. Now, what we uh, what remains to be done in the future is, of course, uh, enhance our Q hat to include this additional scale, uh, do a more realistic calculation of the splitting function to include heavy flavors there as well, and of course, include additional sources of energy loss, in particular, longitudinal, right? either longitudinal drag or even longitudinal diffusion. So drag is E hat and diffusion is E2 hat. And of course, we need to explore this uh, using bottom quarks as well. And finally, uh, this should all be made more, a lot more quantitative by putting everything inside of a, a Bayesian analysis to really be able to pin down the, the, um, the physics of, of heavy flavor and, uh, a lot better. Okay, so I think uh, with this, I actually am on time. And I have another 15 minutes for any questions that uh, anybody may have. Okay, so while we wait for more questions, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Golko again for this uh, uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting talk and uh, well, the overview of a state of the art approach to high PT heavy flavor. Mm -hmm. There's a hand up of uh, Ismail. Do you want to um, 
Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, can I ask a question there? Yeah. Yeah, about this uh, longitudinal energy loss. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe not clear because I, longitudinal energy loss should be there in, in LBT. Do you mean in uh, for the medium induced radiation? Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. In matter as well. In matter as well. In matter as well. In principle, the 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 pieces are there uh in the in the in the in the code the scat the, i mean in the scattering is already has longitudinal energy loss what you mean is i think for the medium induced radiation to depend on it, yes it had instead of just q hat yes and and the, the other thing is um the the same way as as q hat especially at high virtuality um the you need to have these two scales the e, e hat need to hat should also be, be be dependent on these scales as well right so that's that's sort of another another element that needs to be included as well okay yeah thank you Okay, any other talks? I don't see uh, questions. Don't see anything on uh, Slack at the moment? Um, now at the moment. Maybe maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit uh, more on the fourth sub bullet here, the bottom quark energy loss. Uh, um, so from a technical point of view, uh, anything particularly interesting uh, or challenging in the implementation? Or... Not really. Um, from yeah, not not really. It, 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 ultimately, this. Uh, this is a question of, uh, so to speak, of of, of manpower. <laughs> so, so all of these these, these calculations here uh, that I've shown have been carried out by a grad student, um, uh, Wen Kai Fan, who was who was a Duke, and he um, uh, he recently graduated as of last year, actually. So, so basically, we did, what we, we would need is is manpower uh, that to be able to do this um, mm -hmm. that. Yeah, essentially to, to, to carry this project forward, really. I have another question. Is, mm -hmm. is there a comparison between the between PS rate and the using this higher twist like you do? Right. So that's another. Uh, uh, that's a calculation that we can do rather straightforwardly. Uh, at least that's uh, what a budget was telling me at at, at, Quar at hard probes was that there is a trick basically where we can do to. Um, calculate what the splitting function is in, in the higher twist side. Um, but um, yeah, it, it just hasn't been done yet. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if it's like in the yeah, yeah. light flavor that you can get the same. Um, yeah, it's all a question of similar of, of, results. 
That's right. It's all a question of ha having the same kinematic regimes as well, uh, being uh, um, uh, applicable to, 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 to all cases, right? So you don't want to go in deep into the BDMPS regime because that 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 in uh, you know that that assumes that you have sort of a um, um, really what you want to do is more like an, an, an opacity expansion uh, in the sense that uh, where you can essentially count how many scatterings that you actually have inside of your system, right? Um, the you don't want to essentially go directly deep into the LPM regime re resum all of the all all of the interactions immediately, right? So the, the the comparison has to be sort of carefully done, right? Because so some calculations are valid in, in different kinematic regimes and you should really be comparing them in the right in the right region. But yes, it would be very interesting to look at uh, what, how, how this, these things change depending on the, on, on the formalism. Still have a few minutes. Still 30 participants, so we should be able to find another question or two. <laughs> That's okay. But I mean, regardless of whether they find a question now or whether they have a question later, I'll have a look yeah. at the back. And, and, um, okay, very good. For, for, for the duration of the school, if there's anything, I mean, even after, right? It's, it's, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. Okay, maybe maybe we can go for an early lunch. Uh, then, uh, fair enough. <laughs> maybe Slack will become uh, will stay available. And uh, let's thank uh, Goiko and the other speakers again for um, a very uh, informative morning session. And uh, we'll continue uh, we'll continue later. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I think thank we you. can. Stop the, the recording. Thanks, Gunther. Thanks, NG, and also thanks all. The we should also thank the organizers for uh, kind of putting this all together. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. See see everyone tomorrow. We have the Bayesian inference session and promises to be a lot of fun. See you all then. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.